Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome you all to our the, uh, Gaini Oncology Imaging Series, joint initiative of the Oncology Club Bangladesh and Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And we have started the session two with three weeks back. And today is our the last day of the session. The faculties here, it is jointly they organized by the Oncology Club. As you know, they about the Oncology Club today, probably they, we have the new faculties. So I am sharing something about the Oncology Club because this oncology club, Professor ABMA Purim sir, she has started this under the one umbrella, the, all the faculties of the oncologist. And today is the third day of the gynae oncology imaging series. And the, the today I think we have the new faculties today. So I want to share something about the oncology club. The oncology club which was created by our, the Professor ABMA Purim sir, in 2007, the first the Congress of Oncology Club it was started in in Dhaka, and it is the um, the Oncology Club. We started the South Asian Federation of the Oncology Club, and our the uh, president she had his the aim was that the all the oncologists in this region they will get together, they will sit together and make a joint community in this region. And accordingly, the Oncology Club they arrange the yearly the South Asian Federation of the Oncologists. This year, this program is in Bangladesh and it will be in Dhaka in Army Golf Club. And as all you know about the Tata Memorial Hospital, and we have the three, we have tried to cover the all the topics of the imaging about the ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, and the, we have the eminent faculties from the whole the India and Dr. Palok Purpas, he tried to accommodate the, all the topics and tried to cover all things in these three days. And the, behind this, the great lady who did all things. And we are, and uh, at last we want to invite you, the, all the people who are there, if, we are, if you, we will be very happy if you attend in Bangladesh, we try to host you and we, we uh, invite you all to attend our This Oncology Club program in 17th to 18th November in Bangladesh. And I, at last, I want to give you an information that like an iceberg, the Dr. Palok, she did, the, all the pain goes to her and taking all the pain, she made this program. I think this is a successful program because by the, we, um, we thought that we know many things about the imaging, but in last three days series, we have known that some things with that, what we know is that the superficial things and Dr. Palok and her all her the faculties, they make this program so easy. And so they, um, in a nutshell, that we can easily treat our patient even after our, their, without their communication directly. Sometimes we cannot communicate with our radiology colleague. We can treat our patients and we can make the decision. And this is the end of this uh, my uh, talk, talk. And at first, I would like to be today we are conducting the doctor, Dr. Farana uh, Hawk. She will with me, and the rest of the session will be conducted by the Dr. Farana Hawk. Dr. Mm -hmm. Farana Hawk, please they introduce the speaker today, and we will try to start the session because we are already 15 minutes late. Over to you, Dr. Madam, Farana Hawk, please. Thank you, madam. <laughs> Am I audible? Yeah. Please make the make the other participant mute without the faculties. Please, Shagur. Assalamu alaikum. I did it multiple um, times. Good afternoon and welcome you all to our uh, last day session on Dino Onco Amazing Series. Uh, today we have five eminent speakers. Uh, um, uh, our first speaker will get 20 minutes and extra two minutes for question answer session. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sneha Shah, a Professor, Department of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, India. Uh, her talk on evidence on the role of PET city in gynecology malignancies role reserved as a problem solver versus one stop imaging. Uh, Dr. Sneha Shah, madam, over to you. In Bangladesh. Yeah. I'm going to be speaking to you about the role of PET city in gynecology malignancies 
we should try to see whether PET CT is really a problem solver or it can be used as a one stop shop imaging. The topics to be covered will be under the following headings where I shall use cervical cancer as a prototype and I will evaluate the impact of FDG PET CT at staging, at response assessment, at restaging, and then cover up a little about uterine cancers and a little more about ovarian cancers. Let's look at the 2018 PIGO staging for uterine cancer. There has been a significant change from the 2009 staging to the 2018, where we have started introducing the presence of nodes pre-operatively. We must remember that the 2009 staging was based on the surgical a post-surgery staging, whereas in 2018, there is a scope for pre-surgery staging huh? using imaging. That's okay. Let's okay. see what this means. This is a staging huh? parameters, and what I would want you to look at carefully is this component where it mentions that stage three onwards means that there is a presence huh? of nodes or a soft tissue which is leading You have muted. We all are aware that the T staging of the tumor is done using an MRI because it needs to know the thickness of the disease and the infiltration into the adjacent tissue. And the MR resolution is best suited to do this role. However, in places where MR is not available, that is low resource countries, USG using an endovaginal or an endorectal probe may be used. Let's see where PET CT has a role. We all know the resolution is poor, so PET CT cannot help in T staging. But there are papers and literature available to say that PET CT may help being a prognostic indicator where the uptake pattern might help you decide whether the disease is distant, has distant spread or it is localized. There is this study which evaluated 240 patients from the stage 1 to stage 4B and looked at all the types of uh, squamous carcinomas and they identified that the, there was no correlation of the tumor volume with the SUV max of the primary tumor. But it did show that there was a difference in the uptake pattern in the squamous cancer and non-squamous cancers. Of the squamous cancers, those tumors with poorly differentiated um, uh, pathology showed a higher uptake. It said that the higher the SUV, which was greater cut with a cutoff point of 5, all those patients with greater than 5 had a higher propensity for lymph node meds. With those above 14, about 72% of them would have nodal meds. Coming to nodal staging in cervical cancer, we just discussed that whenever there is a clinical suspicion of a cervical cancer, an MR or a CT is done, which evaluates the local infiltration and the size and categorizes the patient into either a stage 1B, a 2A, or a 3A. When you do an imaging, that's when you look at the presence of nodes. And this categorizes the patient in the presence of nodes into stage 3C. C1, if there are pelvic nodes, and C2, if there are associated retroperitoneal nodes. This annotation is known as an RN1 or an RN2. If it were post-surgery, then it would have been PN1 and PN2. The FIGU report mentions that there is no specific imaging modality which they suggest. The, the, what they suggest is that the imaging should be quick and should not delay the staging. So let's see what the conventional imaging modalities like CT and MR which have been done so far, where, how they evaluate nodes. They generally evaluate nodes on the size of the lymph node or the distortion of arteries. And we all know that there could be diseases which are smaller than one centimeter, which is the criteria, or they could be rounded and yet have a disease. The other pitfall is that there could be difficulty in differentiation and metastatic lymph node from a hypoplastic lymph node. In this scenario, PET CT, where does PET CT stand? People have evaluated the role of PET CT in early cervical cancer those in 1B and stage 2, and they compared the uptake or the identification of nodes on an MR with the histopathological correlation of the nodes which were 
removed during surgery. They found out that PET CT had a sensitivity of 91% and a specificity of 100%, which makes it a very useful modality. What we must remember when we do to prevent the false negatives is to evaluate the patient after voiding or an immediate post-void scan. Take the scans from pelvic below to up to the head. What this shows you that if this scan was done, you could, you're you not very confident whether this to focus of foci of uptake is because of nodes. But when you empty the bladder, you very clearly can see a node in the adjacent to the primary tumor as well as those in the upper pelvic region. There has been a study in a very early breast uh, cervical cancer where you have stage 1A or B patients and these patients again had undergone a surgery and a histological correlation of the nodes along with a PET scan was done. It identified that the PET sense specificity was about 99.7% with a negative predictive value of 99.5 which tells you that if a PET is negative, you could avoid a lymphadenectomy. This is an image of the same study which shows you a patient of 1B clinically who was evaluated and then a PET scan showed focus of uptake in the retroperitoneal region and the higher abdomen which correlated to a very small node in the IO2 cable region which would not fit into the criteria of a metastasis. A meta-analysis done in 2010 which evaluated 20 cases of PET CT and 20 cases of CT scan and 30 cases or 30 studies of MR showed that a PET CT had a specificity of 97% in identifying nodes. When you looked at a combination of PET CT with an imaging modality for local evaluation, the PET CT combination with either a dedicated CT or an MR fared equally well. This was a part of that study which showed the presence of nodes very easily identified on a PET scan. Another meta-analysis done seven years later evaluated 67 studies which looked at the specificity and sensitivity of CT in identifying nodes, which was 91% specificity. It also looked at PET CT and identified a sensitivity of 83%, which was much better than a sensitivity of 59% with a 91% specificity for locally advanced and a 98% specificity for early disease which was a very good sign. When they looked at MR of the, uh, in this study, they found that the MR also fared as well as PET CT. So these are images which, try, which I shall try to explain. This is this node on the CT scan, which is suspicious, also seen on an MR, and you can see a good focus of uptake on the PET CT. In this study, the primary is a very small lesion, and you can see a small focus of uptake seen in the presacral region which you can see on a CT scan as a very small node, which would not fit into the criteria. And MR also shows the same. It tells you that the PET CT identified sub-centimeter size node and was very useful in upstaging the disease. The same study, when looked at all the four non-invasive modalities, identified PET CT to have the highest specificity and diffusion MR with the highest sensitivity. We all know PET CT scores over other modalities because of its ability to detect, evaluate the entire body at one stop. It identifies certain regions of metastasis, and of course, it, it is one of the most sensitive modalities to identify marrow disease. The same holds true for cases of CA cervix. This is a case which depicts its ability to identify disease in the supraclavicular region, in the mediastinal nodes, and multiple retroperitoneal nodes, including the lungs. And hence, the American and European guidelines recommend the use of FTG PET CT both where surgery is considered to see whether there's an alteration in the treatment or in a higher stage to look for a change in the RT plan. But this is not always possible. Ma'am, please unmute. We cannot hear. 
or is it just me? Yeah, I cannot hear. No, ma'am. I think Dr. Shahana by mistake has muted herself. Of zero percent in the presence of partial response or new lesions, a, a, a disease-free interval or an OS of seventy-eight percent at a when that scan was showing complete response. We must keep in mind that timing of an FDG PET CT study done post local therapy. If an RT is done, it should be done after eight to twelve weeks. And if chemotherapy is given, then after three weeks. This is to avoid any false positive indications. And why would this be? Because there is tissue which gets damaged along with radiotherapy, the adjacent tissue which gets damaged, also leading to false positive signs. In recurrent disease. PET-CT has shown to have the highest sensitivity in identifying recurrent disease as compared to the other conventional modalities and it stands as of present one of the most indicate, uh, highest indication for a pet -CD. Coming to the uh, cancers of the uterus, we, just like in CA cervix, cancers of the uterus are upstaged in the presence of nodes and that is where both CT or PET CT will be useful. A study which was done, the ACRIM, which is one of the most largest evaluated study, which looked at patients with both cervical and endometrial cancer, identified that PET CT had a very high sense specificity and negative predictor value, and it suggested that it should be a modality of choice whenever available for staging, especially for identifying disturbances. Another study, meta-analysis, which was published in JNM, also identified a very high specificity of PET-CT. With this in mind, we must remember that PET-CT is really useful in avoiding lymphadenectomy in cases of both CA cervix as well as in cases of CA endometrium. The study also looked at different settings and saw, uh, showed that PET-CT again had a high sensitivity and specificity. When you compare an MR with PET CT, where MR is usually utilized for a T staging, it, the study in this study identified PET CT to have the highest specificity both in lymph node staging as well as in identifying distal nodes. All these studies together tell us that PET CT can be evaluated wherever available as a one stop imaging, but could be used as a problem solver where it is not available. Moving on to the next malignancy, ovarian cancer. PET CT has a role to play in identifying the presence of malignant disease versus borderline or benign ovarian pathology. It cannot differentiate benign versus borderline. And the higher the grade of the tumor, there would be higher uptake as seen in many other malignancies. Where does PET CT stand in helping management of the cases of CAO? In the 2018 FIGO report, the ovarian, fallopian, and peritoneal disease have all been combined into one disease group, and staging is usually considered to be surgical, which has changed the earlier staging to further subgrouping stage 1 into C1, C2, and C3. However, in the uh, cases of stage 3, where 3B would be microscopic disease with or without retroperitoneal nodes, and stage 3C, there would be presence of retroperitoneal nodes with peritoneal disease is where PET-CT would have a role to play because PET-CT has a good sensitivity in picking up peritoneal disease, which would be in the range of 2 to 5 centimeters, where increased glucose uptake would help you identify peritoneal disease or maybe also identify a large tumor body. This helps in deciding the debulking versus not Previously treating with chemotherapy followed by Dubai, a large tumor burden may, receive, may be benefited with a new adjuvant chemotherapy. Like in this case, where the tumor burden is very large, an FDG PET CT has helped you identify a very large tumor burden, and these patients would benefit from a new adjuvant chemotherapy. We must keep in mind that the uptake of FDG PET CT is dependent on the number of cancerous cells and in tumors which are of serous or mucinous origin. The cells, there's a possibility of cancer cells and hence the uptake of FDG might be very low to absent. And this is where false negative PET-CT can come into picture. 
PET CT is very useful in the recurrent setting of ovarian cancer, where it can also help identify disease when it is clinically suspected, but the CA 125 levels are still in the normal range. One of the new indications of PET CT is in evaluating the response assessment of patients receiving targeted therapies who do not show significant reduction in size, making the resist criteria not very useful. However, reduction in metabolism would help you in identifying responses. Showing here a case which has very small nodes and peritoneal disease on a, in a recurrent setting, which could have been missed on any other imaging modality, but PET CT has identified them. Keeping in mind what I mentioned earlier, cases where PET CT is negative, you could have disease harboring there, the false negative picture, as in this case, which showed an increase in the peritoneal disease subsequently after one year in a case of an FDG negative case. However, we must remember that there, in this case, which was done later, you could see nodal uptake, which showed that the disease was changing its biology. To summarize, cervical cancer staging, PET CT is a one-stop shop. It could be a problem-solving tool where PET CT is not available. It has a very good role to play in response assessment due to its high sensitivity and specificity. In endometrial cancer, it would be appropriate to use PET CT for staging too. And in ovarian cancer, it can be used as a problem solving for staging, but it could be a one-stop shop for response assessment. I hope I've tried to be uh, elaborate and given out where PET CT stands in the imaging of common gynec cancers. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sinha, ma'am. At last, I did. <laughs> and we are very happy. We are in dilemma that last time and last week, we also couldn't do that. And but it is a nice and the important presentation. I think we the, I request the participants, if you have any questions, please keep your questions in the chat box. So Dr. Sinha, ma'am, she can the answer the questions because she's in the airport. And so that she sent the she was in the airport and so she sent this in earlier at noon to us and at last we tried to make it the possible and our um, another the, uh, important issue there is we have the poll questions today and the all the participants they are requested that to attend the session up to the end of the session we will show you the poll questions that you are requested to answer the poll questions and we have the uh, attractive prizes for the poll winners and so all are requested to stay up to us at the end of the session. Over to you, Neela. Parana Hawk, you please go to the now um, uh, ask our the next speaker. Parana, please. Yes, madam. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Akshar Bahati, MD. Assistant Professor, Department of Radio Diagnosis, Tata Memorial Hospital, affiliate, uh, affiliate instructor, Body Imaging University of Washington Medical Center, Seattle. Uh, his talk on response assessment in oncology, resist and eye resist criteria. Uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Akshay Bhatti, over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Yeah, um, hopefully you guys can see and see the screen and hear me clearly. Yes, Akshay. Hi. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. So thanks a lot, Palak, and thanks to the oncology group for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, so I'll be speaking on re response assessment in oncology. Uh, and of course, the main component is going to be resist, but I'll also talk a little bit about resist and about you know alternate responses that we do see in clinical practice. So... Uh, so, you know, recess is essentially, as you already know, uh, is essentially for a trial setting, but it has helped us a lot in standardizing, you know, the basic minimal investigations uh, which are needed in an oncology setting. And it has given a list of principles which should be applied even in clinical practice. So first we'll talk about recess tells us and then how to apply it even in clinical practice beyond the trial setting. So what does recess say? X-rays, uh, 
you know you can measure the lesion and use it in a trial setting on x rays only when it is completely surrounded by normal lung parenchyma ultrasound is not recommended in recess and uh, ct should have at least a 5 mm slice thickness so you don't really need 1 mm every time even a 5 mm is fine but nothing thicker than that and a single phase cct is enough uh, unless it's an hcc or a neuroendocrine tumor where you would need an arterial uh, or a delay otherwise a single phase ct is enough to stage or restage a disease uh, as far as mri is concerned it has to be tailored to each and every cancer so there are no specific criteria given um bone scan is not recommended and of course for pet ct we have the persist criteria which we will not be discussing today so essentially as we all know recess talks of these four types of response cr pr pd and stable disease um yeah but you know when it comes to us when the, the, the scan comes to it the first thing we have to decide is how to select and then how to measure a lesion so a lesion essentially is like a three dimensional structure and ideally there should be a volume which you know we, we should be able to measure but most lesions are more or less you know um, uh, spherical or uh, you know one dimension is usually enough you know so usually in clinical reports you will get two dimensions and uh, recess actually did a, a prospective study looking at whether one dimension is sufficient whether it's as good as giving two or three dimensions and the answer was yes it's, it's in clinical practice as well as in the research setting one dimension is actually quite good so in recess all we require is the single longest dimension so what is a measurable lesion any lesion which is more than a centimeter on ct or more than 2 cm on an x ray is considered a measurable lesion why is that so because you know the ct thickness is 5 mm minimum uh, and we assume two slice thicknesses at least so 10 mm so that any volume averaging is taken care of so we say measurable lesion of at least 1 cm on ct uh, a lymph node with a short axis diameter more than 15 mm is considered measurable so although Uh, we say that you know one centimeter diameter, short axis diameter is when we consider node as significantly enlarged. Uh, as far as ECS is concerned, more than a centimeter short axis diameter is an abnormal node, but not a measurable lesion. For it to be measurable and used in a trial as a measurable lesion, it should be more than fifteen millimeters. But remember, this is the short axis diameter and not the long axis. Uh, we can consider skeletal metastasis only if it has a soft tissue component, which is again more than a centimeter, equal or more than a centimeter on CT. So, for example, these are uh, you know examples of measurable lesions. You know, you know more than a centimeter each, well-defined lesions. So these can be used as measurable lesions. Over here, this is a node. So this is a measurable node because it, the short axis diameter is more than 1.5 centimeters. On the other hand, here is a smaller node. Although it is necrotic, it looks like it's abnormal, but it is sub-centimeter in size. So it's not a measurable node. Suppose this was 13 millimeters, it would become an abnormal node on this side, but still not a measurable node. So an abnormal node would be, you know, in the non-measurable uh, disease, it would be counted as non-measurable disease, but not considered a measurable lesion. Uh, when it comes to bones, here is, for example, lytic lesion. So any lytic metastasis is abnormal, but it's non-measurable disease. But if it has a soft tissue component which is more than a centimeter, then it is considered as measurable disease. And uh, as far as nodes are concerned, I think important to remember that one view is really not always enough. So, for example, here is a node. So this is a patient with cervical cancer. and we can see it looks a little irregular in shape you know so morphology wise we would think this is a little abnormal in morphology you know so we all know that in nodes size is one thing but morphology also important um we need to look at the shape of the node the margin of the node as well and the you know whether there's any heterogeneity in the node so if you look here it doesn't look around it looks a little irregular but one view is never enough in a node uh, you have to look at two views so if you go to the other view you can see it's actually a pretty flat node right if you look at the coronal we all we did was we took an axial at this level and that is why it looked a little abnormal but it's clearly a normal node the short axis actually just this much it's clearly a normal oblong node and it's not malignant so two views is always required particularly for node because what can look round is actually oval over here right so if is imagine an oval node like this it take a cross section it looks round so we need two views for nodes Okay. What about non-measurable lesions? Any lesion which has short axis diameter less than, sorry, with a diameter less than a centimeter, and nodes between 10 to 15 millimeters are considered non-measurable disease. And again, you know, other examples would be skeletal metastasis without a soft tissue component, or you know, what we all see in ovarian cancer: ascites, peritoneal thickening, um, pleural effusions, and for other cancers, bowel thickening, infantile spread, lymphopenia disease. So all of these are non-measurable lesions. and there are, there's a reason because it's very difficult to reproduce these measurements right so here is for example stomach cancer and it's not very sure right i mean what to consider as disease some of this is lumen some of this is thickening 
um, and if you you know we take a lateral decay putus and sort of distend the stomach this is thickening this is thickening right but again so it all depends on the degree of distension and it, it's not reproducible and hence we don't do it same for the peritoneal disease uh, it will vary depending on the slice uh, thickness the the slice location and the peritoneum will also you know look different on uh, every subsequent scan so we generally do not consider it measurable disease unless we have a well defined so for example this is a more than a centimeter that could be considered a measurable disease otherwise this ill defined nodularity is all non measurable disease Right. So here's an example. So this is all non-measurable. We see ascites, we see clear peritoneal thickening or mental nodularity, but it's all non-measurable disease. Okay, so when what do you use to select a target lesion? So uh, target lesions have to be selected prospectively on the baseline scan, and they usually have to be well-defined lesions which can be easily reproducible. Um, so any measurable lesion which is more than a centimeter in size or for a node more than one and a half centimeter, and well-defined and easily reproducible should be selected as the target lesion. And maximum thesis says you can select up to five target lesions, but only two sites per organ. So if you are just peritoneal disease, you can only select up to two target lesions, which if, if it has measurable component. If there's just nodes, then again, just two nodes. So we cannot measure five nodes. So that's what thesis says, and that's because, you know, uh, that is enough to really uh, give a fair idea about the response. And then you sort of, uh, add up all the longest dimensions and use that to calculate the response, the sum of the longest diameters. So over here, for example, this would be a nice target lesion. This again, these are well-defined lesions. On the other hand, something like this is rather ill-defined. So this would not be a great target lesion. And I would try to avoid using this as a target lesion unless there's no other option. Uh, and that is something while this is for rhesus, even clinical practice, generally radiologists will try to measure the more well-defined lesions and use that uh, you know, for the reporting. Uh, and here again, so this is ovarian cancer, momentum spread. So obviously these are nice target lesions, well-defined over adnexal masses, while this is non-measurable disease. So we cannot use that as a target lesion. Uh, sometimes what happens is, you know, for example, at baseline, this is a lesion. So we measure it like this, uh, but on the follow-up, it sort of becomes a decoalysis. So this was basically confluent sort of multiple nodules together. And now they've shrunken down and become more individual. So now what do we do? So in recess, what we say is we just add up the longest dimension of both of them and see the difference between this and that. And that's what we use. And vice versa as well. So two small lesions and they coalesce later on on the follow, then again, the same thing. Okay, so, I mean, we all know about the response. So now I'm not gonna go into details of, you know, what is PR, what is PD? It's 30%, 20% as we all know. But uh, what we essentially do is total up all the target lesions. So some of the longest diameter that is used for calculation but also at least five millimeter absolute change is required for any individual target lesion. So just because something which was uh, 10 millimeters, for example, becomes 13 millimeters, that's not enough. Although it's 30% increase, that's not enough. At least a five millimeter absolute change is required. Um, and the comparison will always be with the nadir or the lowest sum of dimensions. So I'll give you an example. For example, on the baseline scan, suppose the sum of longest dimensions was 20 millimeters. After treatment, it became 10 millimeters. So the, the, the sum of target lesions has decreased by more than uh, 20% and there's response. Sorry, more than 30% there's response. Um, then on the follow-up, so this is partial response. Then on the follow-up, uh, it's increased, but it's, it's so, you know, it's a 40% increase, but the absolute difference is less than five millimeters. So this is still stable disease and not progression. And on the, and this is now clearly the nadir, right? It's not going below this. And then when it becomes uh, the third follow-up, for example, it becomes 18 or even 16 millimeters, then that is considered progression because that is more than five millimeter absolute change and more than 30% increase. So this is um, uh, PD. But what do we do about non measurable disease? So there has to be unequivocal progression. So just like mild increase, mild subjective increase is not enough. So effusion from moderate to severe, not, not really enough. From minimal or mild to severe, yes, that is enough. Right, something like this is unequivocal. Something like this is, you know, it can be subjective. There can be other reasons for effusions increasing or decreasing. Um, you know, something like lymphangiectic spread in lungs, spreading from one lobe to both lungs. Yes, again, that is uh, unequivocal progression. But if there are already like 25 nodules in the liver or in the lungs, and you see a few more nodules which are tiny, not really unequivocal progression. So that can all be subjective. So for example, here is a case again of ovarian cancer. We do not see a lot of disease. So this, one, this is a patient responded well to chemo. This is a follow-up scan. But then on the next follow-up, we see 
clearly, you know, moderate ascites, new nodularity, zeperitonal thickening, and then this is clearly progression. So this is unequivocal progression. So although this is progression by non-measurable disease, they still consider PD. Uh, and the last thing is any new lesion, uh, if it's a measurable lesion, meaning more than a centimeter, indicates progression. So nothing in the lungs, and then suddenly you see this nodule, that's progression. Um, so a new lesion sort of indicates progression. Then even if the rest of the disease is stable, uh, it is still PD. But uh, always we have to really look very carefully to be sure that it's a truly new lesion because that completely changes everything for the patient. Um, yeah, so as I said, you know, it's meant for trials. This is meant for trials. So we do not literally apply it for routine reporting. Uh, so, you know, uh, but the principles behind resist is what, what guides our report. You know, so the, what is the principle? We have to measure reproducible lesions, which are nice target sort of lesions. So we generally measure well-defined lesions and not ill-defined passes. We generally would not give measurements of like hollow viscous and, you know, based on that talk of progression. Okay, that is not something which is reproducible. Uh, we don't measure too many lesions, right? Even if we see multiple nodules, multiple mets, we would measure only a few of them because that is enough. We in routine reporting would not add up the sum of longest dimensions. In fact, you would generally give two actual dimensions, not one. Right? So most of the times, you, you most of the reports will have you know two dimensions on the report and not just one. And that's what most of us follow. Although recess is only one, we would give two, but we would not add up the longest dimensions. And um, again, so progression is something you have to really uh, think hard and then decide. And you know, you know, subjective mild increase in non-measurable disease, we would not call that as progression even in routine clinical practice. So, sort of these principles are something which you need to apply to routine clinical practice. And of course, most important thing is you have to look at all relevant priors because the nadir might actually be two scans prior. So, you know, we might see there's a marginal increase and decrease uh, increase in the disease compared to the prior study, but then we have to go back to an older scan and see whether you know what was another because that's the, the the place from where progression has to be measured so sometimes there are cases when you know the disease keeps increasing mildly over time and because we keep comparing with only the immediate player we always call it stable and that should not happen we should go back to prior scans and see whether there's actually overall an increase which is gradually happening uh, so that becomes important especially you know something like uh, well differentiated um, uh, uh, low-grade uh, serious adenosia which goes slowly there are times when you really need to go back over two or three trials and figure out. Now, IVSIS is, you know, relatively straightforward. Um, everyone knows the uh, principles of immunotherapy. This is an oncology setting, so I'm not going to go into the, the mode of action. But what we know is that basically immunotherapy can cause four types of responses. One is a very straightforward thing. This is the baseline, and there is decrease in the disease burden. And that's straightforward. And it's, you know, the IVSIS over here would be similar to which is 1.1. So, so uh, in IVC, everything else is the same. The, the, the PD, SD definitions are all the same. It's only what to do if it progresses or there's a new lesion, what do you do then? That is the only change. So in this case, uh, we just you know say that, okay, the SLD has decreased and this is partial response. Uh, sometimes what happens is it remains stable uh, or it remains stable here and later on it might actually decrease or continue to remain stable. And again, that is SD. So, or, you know, SD at this point, later on, it may become PR or it may remain SD. And that is, again, fine, not a confusion at all. But sometimes because of our body's uh, immune reaction and, you know, then the, 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 the immune response causes, uh, you know, what looks like an increased lesion. And, uh, and this is what, it happen what happens, right? We, on the baseline, there is a smaller lesion. Follow up, it appears that it has increased in size, and that that's because of the immune response and the associated uh, changes in the morphology. And then it decreases on the follow up scan. So, at, at the first time point after immunotherapy, we will, even though it has increased and it is PD, we will not call it just PD. We will use the term IUPD or I is for immuno, immunotherapy. So, I is the I, I is the I. And then unconfirmed progressive disease is what we say, UPD. And uh, that's because we're not sure. Maybe, you know, at this time point, we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it will shrink to the, at the next time point it may further increase. So this is when we use the term IUPD. And similarly, if there's a new lesion, then again, what we do is we add the new lesions diameter to the sum of the longest dimensions. And uh, it's still called IUPD. So the sum of longest diameters will increase, you know, because uh, apart from the original target lesions, now we have a new lesion which we have added but it's still not progression, it is still IUPD. And then on the next time point, 
then we see if if it continues to increase then it is true progressive disease or if it shrinks then there's partial response so what does iris say if you see iupd then you do follow up scan after 4 to 8 weeks and depending on what you see on the follow up scan then you call it either stable disease partial response or complete response or 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 p r i c when you just shuni you me shuni na uh, i think someone mike is on let's see okay so yeah so uh, when do we say pd we say uh, so if it continues to progress then we use the term icpd or confirmed progressive disease and if it's icpd then the time point of progressive disease is considered from uh, from here right so from the first time point so when we said iupd that is the time to progression but actually we call it progression only at the next time point icpd is the term used here for the time to progression to calculate from here i hope everyone uh, is, is with me on that but uh, so that's what we do now here's an example for here this is uh, I, unfortunately i couldn't get a gynec case but this is a melanoma metastatic and then uh, you know what happens is the primary seems to have decreased nicely but there is this new lesion we are seeing here and so because there's a new lesion we call it iupd and then we go to the next time point and clearly this continuous to decrease of new lesion is also improved now so now we can call it ipr a partial response so and and on the other hand suppose on the next time point this continued to increase and this had also started increasing then this would become disease progression or icp okay so you know the main problem with uh, tumors is that they don't always read the criteria so although the focus was going to be on rhesus and irises i thought i also talk about a little bit in 5 minutes on some uh, unexpected uh, you know responses which don't read these criteria based on just size and you know new and uh, not new lesions uh, so morphology is also very important and that's what radiologists need to really focus on especially when you know the clinical situation is different and what we see is different so clinically patients doing well but we see something uh, increasing or the tumor markers are fine and we see something increasing so then we have to correlate a lot of stuff and uh, morphology is also the key especially nowadays with the targeted therapy we have so for bones for example um uh, lytic lesion will not respond with you know uh, just shrink it it will respond with sclerosis so for example here is a lytic lesion and with you know there will be sort of centripetal sclerosis so it starts becoming sclerotic and over time it becomes completely sclerotic so this is what happens with bony mets they usually just become sclerotic the problem with that is suppose there was just one or two sclerotic mets at baseline and suppose there were a lot of other tiny lytic mets which we never saw you know if they were below the resolution of the ct but then once you give the treatment and they all now become sclerotic then some people say oh, there are multiple new sclerotic lesions this is progression right this is actually not progression this pseudo progression it actually responds it's just that these lesions are not very well visible on baseline because they were sort of iso dense with the bone so we should not call this progression this is response um on the other hand if you see a nice sclerotic lesion and it starts developing lucency then yes then we are worried then this is i mean you know i wouldn't use the word progression but i would say there is increase in the disease here there is worsening disease burden here so this is what we need to look in bones whether the sclerosis is stable sclerosis is increasing sclerosis is decreasing and lucency is decreasing so that is what is important when it comes to bone lesions if there are lung nodules sometimes they don't shrink they cavitate and cavitation is also considered a sort of response only so even if you see cavitation especially with wedgef right when we use wedgef inhibitors uh, we would see cavitation often in lung nodules and that is also a sign of response and vice versa is also true there's a nodule with a cavity another follow up the cavity fills up then you are worried about the disease increasing so these are all soft criteria this is not pd based on rhesus and so you know generally in our clinical reports we try to avoid saying progression you know unless there's clear cut unequivocal disease we just use terms like there is increased disease burden decreased disease burden so that gives the oncologist a little uh, sort of leeway to you know decide what to do next uh but when we see something like this evil cell look, this looks to have increased and you just correlate with what you are seeing clinically also if the tumor markers also increasing this is also looking like worse then you know you are worried about the disease worsening okay and there are there is at least one small study not in gynae but in colorectal but it says that cavitation may actually uh, indicate improved outcome as well so you know in, you see cavitation we see it sometimes in i think uh, it's uterine medicine not you know uh, in the lungs so uh, it does indicate that it's, it's responding well okay and, and sometimes you know instead of cavitation the 
water just becomes ground glass. So from a solid, it becomes more ill-defined ground glass. And that's also a sign of response. Only thing is the radiologist needs to be very sure to confirm it on thick, thin sections. So five millimeter, may, there might be some volume averaging which might look hazy and ground glass. You have to be sure, look at the thinner sections, three millimeter or one or two millimeter section. And if that also shows ground glass, then we know that this is, in a sense, it's responding to treatment. With ovarian, sometimes we may actually see calcification developing, you know, more somatous changes. And we know that more well deficient tumors are more calcifications. And that can happen, you know. So um, this is pre treatment. And of course, we do see decrease in size also, but clearly increased calcification also. So uh, that also sort of indicates response in ovarian cancer and also in uh, germ cell tumors, sometimes we see calcification. So uh, does that correlate with, you know, survival? Uh, no, not really. It, studies don't show that. Uh, but uh, at least this gives us an indication that it's probably is, uh, responding to the treatment. Um, and it's not just calcification. Sometimes, especially with the germ cell tumors, you may just see cystic changes. You know, the tumor may not shrink too much uh, because the teratomatous component of the tumor is resistant to chemo. So we will see a tumor which over here has solid enhancing components and they, they completely resolve. But what remains is basically this cystic looking nodal mass. And because it's all cystic, it essentially is all teratomatous component. Now, can we be shown just on imaging that there's no tumor in it? No. Uh, the tumor markers really help. So if the tumor markers are normalized completely, then we assume this is all teratomatous component. You will still resect it if it's resectable. Uh, but in this case, for example, there was no scope of resection. There were liver meds and there was this large nodal mass. So we had to just follow it up. And look, three years later, it's still you know stable to slightly decrease in fact. It is improving further. This is all just teratomatous component. So cystic changes in, in uh, you know germ cell tumor with normalizing tumor markers. So this cystic component is just teratomatous, mature teratomatous component in most cases. Although we do end up resecting them in our hospital as long as it is resected. And sometimes, you know, um, you can also see like lipomatous change in the tumors. So teratomatous component can have lipomatous changes. And again, this is again, not resected, but it's, you know, slowly decreasing in size. Uh, but then sometimes you get this growing teratomatous syndrome. So over time, then it again starts increasing. But again, this is just a teratoma. It's, it's not, you know, the tumor markers are normal, it's growing, but it's a teratomatous component is growing. Um, same thing happens in, in some kind of liposarcoma, this mixed liposarcoma post-treatment, you see fatty components. So it's maturing, sort of maturation, adipocytic maturation of the liposarcoma. So again, these are all sort of morphologic indicators. And uh, lastly, uh, sometimes there's no shrinkage, but the solid components becomes hypoenhancing. So this is pre-treatment scan, um, enhancing clearly enhancing solid component particularly the periphery post treatment not much reduction in size but then co solid component is completely or almost completely gone so we know this is response even though the size is stable um, and classically we see it of course with targeted therapy but this was a patient of conventional chemo on kpox so it happens with conventional also so we have to keep a watch for this um, and here's a you know more classic example of of someone on imatinib uh, just an imatinib and again, the same sort of pseudo progression can happen here, right? Because the tumor shrinks, but then you see this new lesion here. And what is this? It's just again, sort of an isodense nodule met here, which was not visualized on imaging. But post treatments became hypodense, and now we can see it. So again, pseudo progression. Uh, and then this is the last case I just wanted to show because this highlights that there, you know, the sometimes when an MR or some tweak in the protocol can help. So this is a patient with uh, high grade serous on surveillance, C125 outside. Uh, and, uh, so outside they did a C125 increase outside the, the CT and it showed a liver lesion. So when the patient came to us, they were like, is it really a liver lesion or is it a perihepatic you know, surface deposit? So they wanted to do an MRI. So we did an MRI and we can clearly see this is a dried cyst and this is a slightly hyper attenuating T2 hyper intense lesion. On the venous phase, it's hypoenhancing. So it looks very suspicious for disease, doesn't it? But uh, we sometimes also do this hepatobiliary phase, you know, and in hepatobiliary phase, what happens is uh, hepatobiliary contrast is contrast, which is uh, taken up by the normal liver parenchyma. So if any uh, soft tissue has liver functional hepatocytes, it will take up the hepatobiliary contrast. If any soft tissue doesn't have functional hepatocytes, it will not take up. So what do we see on the hepatobiliary phase? This is a cyst. It doesn't have functional hepatocytes. So it doesn't take up the hepatobiliary contrast. While what happens to this lesion? This actually takes up contrast. What that means is that it has functional hepatocytes, which obviously means that it does not have metastatic ovarian cell tumor, right? Because ovarian cells will not pick up uh, hepatocyte, uh, hepatobiliary contrast. So again, this helped us tell them that, I'm, I mean, the tumor markers are increasing, but this 
hepatic lesion is not a met at all this is just some you know probably some resolving uh, inflammation or infection but clearly not a met so sometimes you know there are uh, you need to use other tools to uh, figure out in you know complex clinical scenarios um, so I, i'll end here but so essentially uh, for a radiologist what we need to be aware of is what the therapy the patient is on because conventional targeted immunotherapy will completely change what we are looking for uh, tumors may respond with altered morphology um rather than decrease size so apart from the size we also have to look very carefully at morphology bone meds can demonstrate sclerosis so we need to be aware of that and of course in immunotherapy we can initially see worsening disease or new lesion and we still have to follow them up and hope for response um so this is a set of two articles uh, we have written from tata on on this topic they are in the journal of gi and abdominal radiology um and if you want to read more details on how to apply these cyst and you know beyond these cyst criteria clinically then these are free access online so this is the journal gi and journal of gastrointestinal and abdominal radiology uh so do have a look at that okay, so I, i thought i'll end with this photograph of the 75th uh, anniversary and this is of course the chhatrapati shivaji terminus of the victoria terminus and uh, very nicely lit up with the tricolor flag so uh, with that uh, thanks a lot and i'll be happy to take any questions thank you sir for your uh, nice presentation our uh, next speaker uh, dr rupa rangan um. Yes, Dr. Farhana, could we just take one question for Dr. Uh, Akshay? There is a question that is asked. Uh, Akshay, are you around? Are you online? Yeah, yeah, I'm online. Yeah, yeah, there is one question in the chat box which says that if tumor marker is normal in nodal meds and an image we see a node with slight change, can we consider it as a response in germ cell tumor? Uh, so if the tumor marker has become so assuming that you know this was a mixed germ cell tumor with raised afp or hcg or something and uh, i think the tumor markers are the main thing so if they are normalized uh, and then we see a node with slight change which i am assuming is cystic change certainly the response is there now the only question which always comes is whether that cystic change is completely teratomatous or is there like a, a few cells which remain you know the non seminotomatous component so that is something we you know right now it is in tata the the philosophy is we will still operate as long as it's operable but there's no doubt that there is response uh, so of course there is response yeah right thank you akshay uh thank you dr sneha yes we got your uh, questions they were very well answered on the chat so uh thank you for being there and we can now move to dr rupa's topic thank you palak thank to everybody bye thank, yeah thank you dr sneha bye Our next speaker is Dr. Rupa Ranganathan, Lead Consultant, Division of Breast and Women's Imaging and Interventions, Department of Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology, Director, Breast Cancer, KMCH. Uh, her talk on current guidelines in gynae onco imaging. Uh, please, Dr. Uh, Rupa Ranganathan, uh, over to you, madam. Uh, thank you. At the outset, I would like to thank the Oncology Club Bangladesh and TMH for uh, inviting me here. I hope my slides are visible and I'm audible. Yes, you are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good evening. So the topic um, uh, will have an overlap with the previous speaker. Uh, this is about the imaging guidelines in gynecological malignancy and when we should be asking under different clinical situations. So the gynec malignancies could be the carcinoma in the cervix, endometrium, adnexa, which includes tubes and ovaries, vagina and vulva. And I will be discussing predominantly the first three topics and I will just summarize the imaging guidelines for vulva and the vagina. What is the role of imaging and what really the oncologists want to know from imaging? First, 
And for certain malignancies, we may need imaging for diagnosis. And mainly in gynecological malignancy, we use imaging for staging workup, post-treatment follow-up, and whenever we suspect a recurrence. Uh, the modalities that are widely used are ultrasound in certain uh, gynecological malignancies for initial evaluation, and MRI remains the main stage, uh, main uh, role for local staging, and CT or PET CT is used for nodal involvement and for distant metastasis, as also emphasized by our previous speakers. The pre-procedural preparation includes um, uh, we need a fasting for at least four hours to limit the small bowel mobility and empty bladder one hour before the study. We do not want a completely empty bladder or an overfilled bladder. And uh, we prefer to give an anti-peristaltic agent and imaging is done in supine position. When we do MR, it needs an at least 1.5 Tesla with a dedicated phased array abdominal pelvic coil. And uh, opacification of vagina with the ultrasound jelly is optional based on the institutional protocols and the saturation band is kept anterior and superior uh, to limit the breathing and also the bubble artifact. In CT, um, 64 slice CT is preferred and positive oral contrast whenever it is required. We need a pre-contrast and a 70 to 90 second post-contrast injection for evaluation. So um, I will touch upon a limited um, uh, the MR, the role of MRI. T2, T1 diffusion and contrast enhanced MRI are used in uh, imaging the gynecological malignancy for local staging, out of which T2 is the key sequence. And uh, many a times we see uh, from uh, different centers where like they, they perform a pelvic MR with uh, like that of a bony pelvic MR suppressing the fat. But we need to remember that in imaging female pelvis, fat is our friend. And hence, um, we will not suppress the fat. And the main sequence that we use uh, for um, staging diagnosis is the T2 sequence. And uh, the, the gynecological organs, uh, the position of the gynecological organs vary from person to person, and also depending upon the filling up of the bladder and bowels. So the it is not one set protocol for all the planning protocol, but it varies for every patient based on the uh, position of the organs and what is the area of interest. So the planning of uterus is very different from planning of the cervix which is very different from planning of the vagina. So we need to actually optimize the protocol and only if we optimize the protocol, we will get the best imaging uh, as shown in the picture. So the cervix planning is very different from the vagina planning. So it is not a true axial, true coronal for, um, uh, for, a, a, for every organ. So we need to see the position of that organ in that particular imaging uh, time. The next is the field of view. So again, many a times we see people use a large field of view uh, for imaging carcinoma cervix staging, which is absolutely not necessary. As you can see that the top um, uh, case, both is the MR imaging of the same patient. This was the MR, which was done elsewhere, where they have used a very large field of view. We don't need to cover from skin to skin and from this end to that end that we basically have to optimize the FOV, the field of view to have a best imaging resolution. So as you can see, this is very difficult to see. We can identify the tumor, but we will not be able to identify the actual extent infiltration, parametrial involvement with this large FOV. So this is a difference. And uh, yeah, also in the axial. Um, second is also the vaginal opacification. So you feel if it is uh, better to have a vaginal opacification, but there are institutions which do not follow vaginal opacification, but still will have a good field of view to have the better reporting. And uh, I have taken guidelines from the European Society of Urogenital Radiology from NCCN and ACR, and also from AJCC and FIGO staging. And this is a comprehensive um, imaging guidelines from all the standard uh, guidelines across the world. So let us first see the imaging in the carcinoma of cervix. Uh, we really don't need imaging for diagnosis. So the clinical examination and the histopathology is the one which is required for diagnosing the CA cervix and imaging has no role in the diagnosis of CA cervix. So the imaging is used only for local 
clinical staging after it has been histologically proven. And uh, as I said, MR is the key uh, imaging modality for local staging, wherein we assess the size, parametral involvement, pelvic side wall involvement, and adjacent organ invasion. And to also assess whether the lady is uh, fit for a fertility sparing surgery and to, for follow up of during and post treatment evaluation and to assess local recurrence. PET CT is mainly um, uh, superior in assessing the lymph node, uh, even with the normal size. So now we know that the FIGO staging has incorporated lymph node in their staging. PET-CT has a definite role in um, uh, for staging, especially when it comes to lymph node and distant metastasis, and also when it comes to recurrence. So I'm not going in detail with the staging. What we really need to know is the cutoff. So up to stage 2A, we can perform surgery. And once the parametrial involvement is there, the surgery is not offered and the treatment is by radiation with or without uh, chemotherapy there. And the second component that we need to look at is the uh, size of the tumor. So whether it is less than four centimeter or more than four centimeter. So surgery is offered to a patient who is less than four centimeter and a free or non-involvement of the parametrium. And fertility sparing is uh, offered to a woman with a tumor size of less than two centimeter. The tumor has to be more than one centimeter from the internal os and the cervical length should be at least 2.5 centimeter and the lymph node needs to be negative. So the uh, women who do not fall under this category, basically the tumor size more than four centimeter with the parametral involvement will, can, will be offered only radiation and will not be offered surgery. So this is uh, these are examples of various uh, tumor as you can see, the largest dimension can be either in the anteroposterior direction or in the craniocaudal direction. So um, we need to assess the T stage or the tumor size. And uh, the second, as I showed you, this image will not be, we will not be very sure about the involvement of the uh, vagina or the phonesis, but when you give the, uh, distend the vagina with the, uh, with the ultrasound jelly, it is easier to see that this tumor is limited to the cervix and the fornix and the vagina is free. And again, this differs, um, the uh, protocol for uh, vaginal opacification varies from institution. Uh, so, and it basically, we follow vaginal opacification and there are many institutes which do not follow. And the second, um, apart from the size, next to the size of the tumor, as I said, the second most important thing that we need to look at the parametral involvement because that is going to change the management. So a preserved outer rim of T2, uh, which is represented by the cervical stroma. If you see an intact T2 outer rim that rules out a parametral invasion, if you see speculations, nodular tumor to parametral interface or encasement of the parametrial vessels that indicates parametrial invasion. So this is uh, a closer view to show that this is an intact parametrium and there is involvement of the parametrium with encasement of the parametrial vessels, which clearly um, means that there is a parametrial invasion. The next part, which is in relevance to treatment is the involvement of the lower third of the vagina. The part, so what is the lower third of vagina is that part of the vagina, which is posterior to the urethra. So whenever you see a lower third of vaginal involvement, it implies modification of the radiation therapy. And hence this um, uh, factor is important to be reported. And the next component is the parietic lymph nodes. Unlike PET-CT, in any other cross-sectional imaging, what we um, rely is on the size. On the MR, we also see the signal intensity, whether it is necrosis, whether it's showing a heterogeneous enhancement. Again, where the involvement is only pelvic or para-iotic, uh, para again, implies the modification of the radiation therapy strategy. The last component is involvement of the adjacent organs. You can see, uh, so till this point, Till there is involvement of the adjacent organ, the European Society of Euro Radio, um, uh, Euro Eurogenital Radiology actually is um, has mentioned that there is really no need to give a contrast. So um, up for differentiating a parametral involvement, to know the size of the tumor, we really do not have to give a contrast uh, and contrast is not adding any extra information in the staging. The only role of contrast is for the adjacent organ invasion. As you can see, we are not, these are the two, um, the same uh, case where here we are not very sure whether the bladder is involved, but you can clearly say that the mucosa is intact and rest of the bladder is only infiltrated by the cervical tumor. Uh, and uh, this was already discussed. We know that for distant metastasis, definitely PET-CT scores over any other imaging. Um, and the, we, uh, during the therapy, uh, it is also 
uh, sometimes they send us for imaging for intracavitary radiation. So this is an example of the same patient with an who had underwent intracavitary radiation and who was also responded very well. As you can see, the completely hypointense cervix uh, post radiation. And uh, we use MR uh, to also document the complete response. So this is again a complete post RT cervix where you can see a, a, um, intensely high T2 hypointense cervical stroma with no uh, the gray signal of the tumor being seen anywhere else in the cervix. So to summarize, the surgeon wants to know the size of the tumor, the stromal extent, which is very difficult on imaging, involvement of parametrium, lymph nodes. So to summarize the cervical cancer imaging guidelines, so we will be seeing each of the tumors under these five uh, categories. For diagnosis, as I said, there is no need to image for diagnosing a cervical, cervical cancer. It's only a clinical examination and histopathological diagnosis. Imaging, the role of imaging starts only from staging. And for local staging, MRI, and we don't need a contrast unless in doubt we have a doubt for uh, adjacent organ invasion. So the, it is recommended that it is sufficient to perform a non-contrast MRI pelvis to stage the CA cervix. And PET-CT is used for nodal staging and for distant metastasis. Treatment response, again, MRI is the imaging modality of choice. Post-treatment surveillance, again, MRI is the imaging modality of choice. Whenever you suspect a recurrence, Clinically, and they want to know whether it is only a local recurrence, again, for local staging or restaging, MRI is the modality of choice. And when the recurrence is suspected at the level of the node or distant metastasis, PET-CT is a one-stop solution here. So we move on to the imaging on carcinoma endometrium. Unlike the um, uh, cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, we use ultrasound as an initial modality. Why? Because most of the endometrial cancers present with an abnormal uterine bleeding. So when you have an abnormal uterine bleeding, it can be because of the hormonal changes, or it can be because of fibroids, or it can be because of adenomyosis. Uh, so we uh, ordered simple endometrial polyp, atrophic endometrium, endometrial hyperplasia, or a uh, uh, endometrial carcinoma. So many, most of the times, whenever a lady presents with an abnormal uterine bleeding, we the first imaging modality of choice that we use is ultrasound. But ultrasound cannot differentiate a simple endometrial hyperplasia versus an endometrial cancer, and hence we will recommend a histopathological diagnosis. So when uh, this is a case of an endometrial carcinoma, thickened endometrium in a postmenopausal lady with increased vascularity. So we suspect an endometrial hyperplasia and we ask for a histopathological diagnosis. And uh, uh, you need to know a little bit about the endometrial cancer, uh, which is type one and type two. Endometrioid type, which is estrogen dependent, they are usually low grade. They have a course, they start from endometrial hyperplasia to atypical hyperplasia to endometrial cancer, and they have a better prognosis. The type two, which is a non-endometrioid type, which is non-estrogen dependent, usually are high grade and can even arise from an atrophic endometrium and has a bad prognosis. So uh, the prognosis is based on these factors. One is the depth of the myometrial invasion and what is the type and the grade of the endometrial cancer, lymphovascular invasion. So whenever you have a less than 50% myometrial involvement with a grade one or two endometrioid carcinoma with no lymphovascular invasion, they come under the low risk category. A high risk are the one who have more than 50% myometrium involvement and they, when they have a grade three endometrioid and any non-endometrioid with a lymphovascular invasion come under the high risk category. So uh, even endometrial carcinomas, we need to know have certain uh, criteria for fertility sparing. So only grade one endometrial carcinoma which is confined to endometrium with no lymph node involvement and the patient agrees for a close follow-up will undergo fertility sparing treatment. So um, uh, by and large, lymph node metastasis is suspected when you have two features in MRI. One is the deep biometrial involvement, which is more than 50%. And when there is a cervical stromal involvement, because what then the gynae oncologist will know that they have to do extensive pelvic nodal dissection. So um, 
the cutoff here in staging is when it is confined to the endometrium or when you have a less than 50% invasion of the myometrium, there is no need for a lymph node exploration. And when they, have, when they are typical endometrial carcinoma, they can even be operated by a general gynecologist. All other set of patients have to be operated by a gynae oncologist because there is a need for lymph node dissection. So the main point that we are looking at is less than 50% myometrium, more than 50% myometrium, cervical stromal involvement, or which is just an extension into the cervical cavity. So that is a protocol the guideline for imaging the carcinoma endometrium. Here, unlike the CA cervix, we depend a lot on the dynamic contrast MRI. So uh, the dynamic contrast MRI is taken in multiple phases. The first 25 to 60 seconds, what we look at is the subendometrial enhancement. When you have an intact subendometrial enhancement, we know that the tumor is confined to the endometrium. In 90 seconds the, is a time where you can see the best tumor myometrial interface and 2.5 minutes is the myometrial invasion. So these two phases are the one where we really stage the myometrial invasion, whether it is less than 50 or more than 50 uh, percent of involvement. And at fourth minute is the best time where we can image the cervical stromal invasion. So the dynamic MRI protocol is the one that we heavily dependent on. And this is, uh, this is a tumor which is confined to the endom um, endometrial cavity. There is an less than 50% involvement here and there is a fundal involvement here. This is the diffusion and this is the dynamic contrast uh, imaging. So um, if you see an intact endo uh, subendometrial enhancement, it is very reassuring that it is not involved it is still 1A and can be operated. Many a times when you have adenomyosis in the background, it is very challenging to uh, differentiate a myometrial involvement versus a non-myometrial, you know, I mean, confined to the endometrial cavity. The next important point that we look at is the extension into the cervix. So when you have a smooth extension of the tumor from the endometrial cavity into the cervical canal, this is not equivalent to the cervical stromal involvement. However, if you see, and you, and you can see that there is an intact T2 ring as well. But if you see in this case, you can see that the cervical T2 rim is disturbed and you can see that the tumor is extending into the cervical stroma. This upstages the tumor and the chance of lymph nodal involvement, though the imaging has got a normal lymph node is much higher and this doesn't upstage the tumor. So whenever you see a tumor extending into the cervix, it's important to see whether it is a stromal involvement or a just an extension into the cervical canal. As again, you can see there is a serosal up to the serosal involvement. However, the cervical stroma is not involved. Here, the tumor is extending into the cervical stroma as well. Um, and again, for distal staging, we do a PET CT, and this is an uh, image to show there is an adjacent organ involvement. So, what the surgeon wants to know from us is the size of the tumor, myometrial cervical stromal extent, whether serosa, parametrium, adnexa, vaginal involvement is there, adjacent organ involvement, and there is a grossly abnormal lymph node. So, to summarize, uh, unlike the CA cervix, Di for diagnosis, initial diagnosis, we use ultrasound as the screening modality to look for endometrial pathology, though we cannot pinpoint the diagnosis and still dependent on the histopathological diagnosis. And for staging, local staging, again, MRI. And unlike the CA cervix, we depend a lot on the dynamic contrast imaging in different phases to look for subendometrial enhancement, myometrial involvement, and cervical stromal involvement. And a PET CT is recommended to look for nodal and distal metastasis and all type 2 uh, tumor, which is non-endometrial tumor, grade 3 type 1 and 1B type 1, which means it's more than 50% involvement of the myometrium. So these are the times that we rely on PET CT because we expect a nodal involvement and a distant metastatic involvement there. And for treatment response, again, uh, for patient undergoing new adjuvant chemotherapy, again, to restage the local uh, staging, we perform MRI is recommended. And for post-treatment surveillance is mainly dependent on the clinical examination for low and intermediate risk and maybe CT abdomen for high risk. So um, we don't really rely on the imaging.
And for recurrence, whenever a local recurrence is suspected, MRI is the modality of choice. And when you suspect a nodal or distant metastasis, PET-CT is recommended. So uh, the last main um, uh, component of uh, imaging that I'm going to talk about is the ovary and the tubes. Here, again, like an ultrasound, we depend a lot on ultrasound as an initial modality, maybe a maybe it is incidental sometimes she can present with a vague clinical symptom so we start with an ultrasound both in pre and post menopausal women so in an adnexal lesion when you see a definitely benign pathology we stop with ultrasound and we when we see a definitely suspicious lesion the next imaging of choice is uh, recommendation is to do a CT. Whenever you have an indeterminate adnexal mass, by meaning in ultrasound, you're not able to say pinpoint whether it is definitely benign or definitely suspicious. Sometimes we may not be even sure about the organ of origin. The next imaging modality recommended is MRI. So again, I'm not going uh, in detail. So what do we look um, in CT when you see a um, uh, uh, that is expected in a CA ovary. So when it comes to primary tumor, we talk about the size, invasion into the uterus and adnexa, pelvic deposits, rectal and sigmoid nodules, bowel, sidewall invasion. In peritoneum, we should look for a ascites, omentum, mesentery, and paracolic gutter involvement. Lymph nodes, whether it is only pelvic or paraiotic, supradiaphragmatic, especially the cardiophrenic lymph nodes, and the peritoneal disease is divided into upper abdominal right upper subdiaphragmatic disease, porta hepatis, subcapsula, falciform ligament involvement, lesser sac, GB fossa, Morrison's pouch. So all these lists are very important for a gynae oncologist to know whether it is easily resectable, non-resectable, or it's very difficult to resect these deposits. And finally, the parenchymal um, uh, metastatic lesions. So this is a large um, uh, solid cystic lesion, enhancing solid tissue, bilateral ovaries involved. You can see a lot of ascites, not only confined to the pelvis, but the ascites is there all over the abdomen. And um, uh, the uh, next step is to look for the omental deposits, whether there is an omental nod fat stranding or whether there is an omental nodularity or a frank omental caking. We see a large omental mass, which we call it as the omental caking. And all these deposits, whether it is subcapsular deposit, whether there is a subcapsular deposit with parenchymal invasion, how is the porta involved? Is there a falciform ligament involvement? And how is the splenic, um, uh, 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 splenic hyla region? And how are the mesenteric and the omental deposits seen? So we um, uh, th this is a topic per se, but what we can also give the peritoneal cancer um, carcinomatosis index to understand the overall burden of the peritoneal disease. And um, uh, MRI scores in certain areas than the, uh, than the CT um, here. Because when you see a very small peritoneal deposits along the falciform ligament subcapsular area, um, MRI is slightly superior to the CT imaging because of this inherent resolution and also especially the diffusion weighted imaging. And there are enough um, uh, literature supporting the diffusion weighted imaging to pick up these small uh, deposits in the difficult locations. To, to, to summarize, uh, like CA endometrium, we use ultrasound as the initial diagnosis, uh, initial evaluation for the um, ovarian uh, uh, pathology or ovarian malignancy. And here, CT is the cornerstone investigation. If you see all the gynecological malignancies, it's local staging and uh, is, is always with MRI. But when it comes to ovaries and uterus, um, um, ovaries and tubes, the CT is the main cornerstone investigation for staging of the CA ovary. And we use the same CECT for the assessing the treatment response. And imaging is done only uh, when it, there is a clinically suspected or an elevated CA 125 levels during the post-treatment surveillance. And the, whenever you suspect a recurrence, again, CT or a PET-CT scores over, though MRI has got a very limited role, which is coming up now in picking up smaller lesions, which are not directly detected by a CT or a PET-CT. I'll just touch upon the carcinoma of uh, vagina. Um, it, it, carcinoma of vagina accounts for a very small group of patients. 
because only 20% of malignancies involving the vagina are primary vaginal carcinoma. Most of the time in vaginal carcinoma, there is a direct invasion from adjacent malignancies. So any vaginal tumor involving the cervix or the vulva, even if the lesion is centered in the vagina, according to the FIGO, should be characterized as primary cervical or primary vulval cancer rather than the vaginal cancer. So the again, Vagina is easier to examine, so the diagnosis, we don't need imaging for diagnosis. It's basically the clinical examination and the histopathological diagnosis. And uh, like any other gynecological uh, malignancies, we use MR as the primary uh, for local staging, but we can also use CT abdomen or a PET CT. Uh, so, um, and uh, for surveillance, it's always clinical. Only if recurrence is suspected locally or distant, we use imaging. Otherwise, it's morely uh, clinical uh, evaluation is more than sufficient and we don't need imaging at every single point of uh, diagnosis or the surveillance here. In the vulva, um, again, we need to know a little bit about vulva because vulval cancers are majority, uh, unlike the vaginal cancers, will be operated. So uh, again, when the tumor size is less than two centimeter, and it is confined to the vulva, clinical examination is enough to um, go ahead and uh, uh, perform surgery. When the tumor size is between two centimeter and four centimeter, we can do a groin ultrasound basically to look for pelvic lymph node, uh, sorry, uh, for the inguinal lymph node and MRI may be used. Whenever you have a tumor size more than four centimeter and clinically you feel that the adjacent structures are involved with any T size, MRI is required for further staging. And uh, here in vulval cancer, lymph node is the main prognostic factor. So the involvement of lymph node depends upon the tumor size, stromal invasion and uh, lymphovascular invasion like any other tumor. And uh, for diagnosis, because vulva is, is an external genitalia, we don't need uh, imaging for diagnosis. Basically, it is clinical examination followed by histopathological diagnosis. And for staging, as I said, less than two centimeter, no imaging is required. Uh, less than four centimeter, MRI can be used. And if it's more than four centimeter, we know there will be definite lymph node involvement. And so MRI pelvis along with PET-CT is uh, recommended. For treatment response and post-treatment surveillance, it's basically clinical. And only if recurrence is suspected and we need imaging and the recurrence is not in the um, external genitalia, we perform an MRI pelvis and PET-CT for a distant metastasis. So to summarize, gynecological malignancy includes cervix, uh, endometrium, vagina, vulva, and adnexa. And ultrasound is used as an initial modality in evaluation of endometrial pathology and ovarian lesions. And MRI reminds the cornerstone investigation recommended for local staging, except ovary, where C, uh, contrast enhanced CT is the main modality that is being used. PET CT is the most sensitive imaging technique currently available for nodal metastasis and for distant metastasis. Thank you. Okay, any questions, I'm happy to take up. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rupa. Uh, that was very enlightening and I don't see any questions in the chat box uh, okay one minute yeah so i think we can move to the next speaker thank you thank you thank you so much thank you so much uh, madam uh, dr rupa ranganathan for your nice presentation our next speaker is dr ekta dhameja additional professor BRA IRCH, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, uh, had talk on optimum reporting and quality indicators in gynecologic radiology, pitfalls and limitation in CECT, MRI, and PET CT in gynecologic oncology. Please, Madam Dr. Ekta Dhamiza, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, is my screen visible? Am I audible? Yes, it is visible and we can hear you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So, um, Dr. Rupa has actually 
uh, made my work a lot, lot, lot easier. Uh, these all slides are just repetition in a different format, I can say. So uh, we might be able to catch up on time also. Uh, so uh, the basic thing which we need to understand, which we, uh, it is just a summary uh, since it is, uh, we are towards the conclusion. So I would just summarize as to what all uh, we have in our uh, bag to offer whenever it comes to assessment and categorization of the gynecological malignancies. And uh, what are the reporting uh, templates which we follow, uh, a checklist which we always keep in mind. So since it has already been mentioned uh, by previous speakers and it is quite evident, uh, and I am sure everybody must have understood as to what is to be done. So now uh, the question always remains is why not the other modality? So that is what we would try to uh, discuss and try to learn that uh, might just add on to uh, what has been already discussed uh, with respect to the three major malignancies, cervix, endometrium, and ovary. So to begin with CA cervix, since it is the most common malignancies in the female population, it has been repeatedly reinstated that the uh, FIGO staging system has changed and it, it has incorporated uh, the findings on imaging as well as pathology in its staging system because that has grave prognostic uh, value. Uh, and because of that, uh, it becomes important now to understand which imaging modalities are available. And uh, just now, uh, now I would just say that this holds true with each malignancy. So it, uh, we would not go again imaging, imaging, imaging wise with each malignancy uh, because uh, all the pros and cons are inherent with each uh, modality. So what happens is uh, since the time this FIGO staging system has changed and because there was not enough literature evident and uh, as to that they could um, uh, they could put it uh, pen it down whether that this particular patient should undergo ultrasound or should undergo CT or should undergo MR only was not possible, especially because it was a uh, uh, the, uh, the diseases of resource constrained setting and not every patient can afford MRI. So that is why uh, what they have stated in the concluding remarks of the new uh, guidelines or new staging system is that they would want more and more evidence and ultrasound has been used a lot for even staging and uh, delineation characterization of cervical masses also. So uh, we have to understand that ultrasound is very good if being done in good hands and with skilled and experienced uh, radiologist. Otherwise, it will be just a uh, uh, useless endeavor for other, uh, other uh, scenarios. On the other hand, CT and MRI are very good cross-sectional imaging modalities. They are able to give us very good uh, information. But MRI always weighs over CT because of its better soft tissue resolution. However, CT is always better when we want to have uh, a rapid um, uh, evaluation of that particular disease from head to toe in one single setting and it gives information throughout. So just to show the difference why it is not being done for gynecological malignancies, any, be it CA cervix, CA vulva, vagina, endometrium, or ovary, for characterization for the disease, because the soft tissue resolution is very poor. But on the other hand, we can actually assess uh, liver metastasis, bone metastasis, nodal metastasis on CT rapidly as compared to MRI, which is very good for the local staging because we are able to see the differentiation. We are able to differentiate the uh, signal intensity of the endometrium, myometrium, serosa, bladder, surrounding structures. So that is why MR is preferred for uh, the local staging for any uh, disease person. So that is the reason that CT uh, is limited because it is poor for discrimination uh, between the cancerous tissue and cervical stroma, especially when the cervix is just seen as a bulky cervix. So overall staging, the local staging, the accuracy stays as low as 30% with less than 58% positive predictive value for early parametrial inclusion because of this poor soft tissue resolution. However, this is the modality of choice for advanced diseases above stage 2B, especially when clinical assessment says that the parametrial infiltration has already taken place. So it has role in advanced staging and to assess endopathy and monitor the distant metastasis. Uh, having said that, it is not that ultrasound cannot be done at all for CA cervix. We ourselves in our institute have done a pilot study recently, which has been concluded, and it summarized for 60 patients that if it can be used as a screening modality because ultrasound gives you exact um, uh, uh, 
depiction of parametrial infiltration as good as MRI with the sensitivity and specificity reaching up to 80%, especially in the females who cannot afford to undergo MRI. This can be used as a good modality. Yes, it is uh, a bit uh, tricky and a bit uh, uncooperativeness we face from the patient's end, and it is... Um, I would say not very much acceptable, especially if we do transvaginal sonography because there is spontaneous bleeding in CS uh, cervix patients. So in those patients, we had used truss versus TVS. So transrectal ultrasound versus TVS, and we were able to find that even transrectal ultrasound could do as good as 70 with as good as 70 percent accuracy. So uh, in European guidelines, they have instated that. Uh, ultrasound in the form of TVS or trust can be used as a screening modality if MRI is not visible for that particular patient. Or it can be used as a screening tool to assess whether there is lymphadenopathy or not. If there is no lymphadenopathy, that means the patient falls into early staging and local staging is mandatory. MR can be done. If there is lymphadenopathy, then patient can undergo CT. But all these are in the research uh, uh, phase and it is not penned down. It, they have not been incorporated into a uh, FIGO staging system or any other particular staging systems. But um, uh, there are European associations of gynae oncology which have in, included ultrasound within them. So basically, the role is to uh, measure the tumor size, to see the local extent into the cervix, into the uterus, and uh, the distant metastasis in the form of liver metastasis, ascites, or lymphadenopathy, any hydroureteral nephrosis if it is there, because that itself says that there is lateral pelvic wall infiltration. Uh, the limitations it has, as uh, we know that it has low uh, contrast resolution and there are at times overstaging, but if it is done by a skilled and expertise, uh, with a good skill and expertise, it can uh, be very ben beneficial, in especially our kind of setting. On the other hand, uh, uh, Dr. Sneha has very uh, elaborately discussed the role of PET-CT in detection of the nodal or distant metastasis and in recurrent, states, uh, recurrent uh, cancers. And this goes without any doubt. However, it has inherent limitation of CT that the local staging cannot be done. So this is reserved for uh, metastatic setup to rule out any distant metastasis, as Dr. Uh, Rupa also mentioned, that when we have uh, operable cases and we want to be sure that there is no distant metastasis, that can be, we can resort to PET or we can resort to any body MRI uh, and we can have comparison of two because there are studies for that also. So basically, all in all, the nutshell in, for CA cervix, it, uh, MRI remains the modality of choice for depiction of parametrial infiltration especially in the settings when uh, Vani oncologist is uh, contemplating fertility sparing uh, surgeries and we want to rule out whether the adenopathy is looking as metastatic or not especially in tumors <laughs> it is also <laughs> and to assess response to recurrence and it has already been mentioned its pivotal role in the planning of breakage so what has uh, been uh, the guidelines are in stage one cross-sectional imaging is not mandatory it is only the clinical examination which is good enough however there are some scenarios like obese patient or clinical staging is equivocal and tumor size is more than two centimeters but less than four centimeters tumor is entirely within the endocervical canal that means the histopathology has shown that there is malignancy but there is nothing on PSPV examination so in those particular settings even in stage one cross-sectional imaging in the form of MRI is advised and in advanced diseases, CT or MRI, depending on the indication. For surveillance, it is uh, if the patient has undergone surgery, for CD imaging is to be done only if there are any symptoms or if there are clinical concerns. Otherwise, uh, nothing, it is just the clinical follow up and imaging can be done in the form of PET CT to assess if there is any recurrent disease, if there is any pathology, if, and if there is any clinical suspicion. For the stage two and stage four, NCCN recommends PET CT and uh, optional pelvic MRI for if, again, in the clinical setting, if there is clinical suspicion. So MRI is useful for delineate the disease extent and to guide decisions regarding fertility sparing versus non-fertility uh, sparing treatment approaches, while PET CT is helpful to detect and rule out metastasis in operable patients. So um, once we have done MR, it becomes very important to have a checklist in our hand while reporting from the radiologist and, and a way that we are able to communicate the information actually seeked to the surgeon.
be it surgical oncology or be it gynae oncology. So uh, what we perform, uh, we uh, when we do CT or we do MR, what we have to say is we have to define the mass, we have to define its extent. And as Dr. Rupa said, it is the longest dimension which, uh, which is taken into account for staging. It's extension into the uterus, it's extension into the endocervical canal or uh, beyond the cervical canal. If there is any uh, hydropyometra resulting to it, if there is infiltration to the parametrium and which side there is infiltration, whether the infiltration is restricted to parametrium or it is extending to the lateral pelvic walls, infiltration of the surrounding structures and their consequences, presence or absence of lymph nodes and other pathologies, they, these all should be mentioned in the report and should be kept in handy. And all these are available online as well. In the patients who are coming for surveillance, as in after the treatment, the imaging modalities often use the CT as well as MR, and the, the checklist uh, more or less remains the same. That we want to first identify and rule out whether there is a vault mass or not. If there is vault mass, the size and extent, because that will that is what will determine whether the patient can be exposed again to uh, radiotherapy or these kind of treatment, or it will just be a palliative intent. If there is any pathology, uh, whether it is associated with nodal recurrence also, and serious cervix is known to have nodal recurrences, which are infiltrative, just like the metastasis. So at times it is difficult to uh, determine whether it is bone metastasis which is eroding the bone or it is nodal tissue which is eroding the bone um, and, and that will affect uh, the overall intent and overall treatment planning in the form of chemo or radio. So uh, going to the next uh, topic of the intervention now uh, as I already mentioned the basic information which we want in the uh, cancer is degree of myometrial involvement and the only modality which we need to the best accuracy is MRI and that also dynamic MRI, dynamic contrast MRI at that particular time interval. Uh, in addition with diffusion uh, weighted images, both go hand in hand in which we have conducted a study and we saw that we cannot do diffusion weighted images imaging in isolation for interpretation and we cannot go isolated with dynamic contrast enhanced. So we have to interpret and put both together and then uh, see what is the stage. For example, uh, as ma'am has already shown these kind of illustration with her, uh, in the early phase, that is, there is subendometrial enhancement is the perfect phase where we can see whether there is myometrial infiltration or not. And after that is the myometrial enhancement at 60 seconds, 180 seconds is overall whole myometrial enhancement. The myometrial invasion is better depicted in the early phase, and that is why dynamic contrast enhanced MRI becomes the imaging modality. And at the four minutes, it goes the cervical stroma. As I said in the CA cervix, PET CT and CT will not be able to offer this, uh, this much good soft tissue resolution. They are good for staging, but they're not good for local extent of the disease. So while interpretation of these uh, malignancies of endometrial car carcinoma, it becomes important for us to uh, determine and to uh, write down or to mention what is the endometrial thickness and signal intensity, what is the myometrial, the background uh, uh, myometrial looks like, what is the interface, uh, how the interface looks like because at times it is associated with adenomyosis whether this thickening is focal or diffuse uh, the subendometrial zone is preserved or not if diffusion restriction is there or not enhancement as compared to myometrium degree of myometrial infiltration the infiltration of the surrounding structures and be specific while mentioning about cervical infiltration that is cervix infiltration and the surrounding structures and specific mention of lymph node enlargement, be it pelvic or uh, retroperitoneum. And it has become a routine for us for any CA cervix or CA endometrial patient that when we do a local imaging, we always screen the whole abdomen for nodal involvement with a T2 weighted sequence. So at times it often helps us and we need not go uh, for PET CT for these kind of patients because we can just see whether there are any nodal enlargements on MRI itself or not. In the patients for follow-up, if there is clinical suspicion, only when uh, at that time we do imaging, which can be done uh, with CT itself, because what we want to look is whether there is any recurrent vault mass or not, whether there are lymph nodes or not. In equivocal cases, we can resort to other modalities like PET-CT, but in routine, we prefer to do CT. And the logic behind it is basically the resource constraint setting that not all the patients will be able to afford PET-CT, uh, uh, especially in our uh, countries like ours. 
the same holds true for CA vulva and vagina because in that we want uh, good soft tissue resolution. So for local staging, it is MRI. And the checklist also remains the same because the local extent we want particularly to mention about urethras and uh, the bladder and the surrounding bones and soft tissue. And the rest is uh, basically fit. In contrast, ovarian neoplasms are predominantly epithelial neoplasms. And as uh, we know, and as we had taken in the first session also, that uh, uh, the role of imaging starts at the uh, point one, when the patient presents for mass characterization and risk stratification. And if we have clinical suspicion of CA ovary or ovarian malignancy, saying um, there are deranged hormonal markers, so at that time we go to the staging and distribution of metastasis. And in that, we opt CT, and that stays at the cornerstone of uh, what. Uh, investigations. Um, other role of CT will be to diagnose complications, post-surgical changes, uh, especially if the patient has been taken up for HIPAC. So it becomes important for uh, uh, radiologists to understand uh, the impact of the reporting, what we are doing, and uh, how we follow up. So this is just the repetition of the day one and day three. Ultrasound stays as the initial investigation of choice for detection and characterization. It can be in the form of EVS plus TAS. CT is the imaging modality of choice for staging uh, of carcinoma ovary, and MRI stays as a problem solving tool. So uh, uh, on ultrasound, basically, we have to first assess whether there are suspicion of malignancy, there are features which are suspicious for malignancy, and then correlated with CA-125 based on whatever scoring system you are using, you have to be in communication with your surgeons. We can use RMI, we can use IOTA, we can use URAT. So whatever, the important thing is to understand the impact and the uh, imaging features, and then communicate in whatever uh, is the platform that you uh, both have chosen, the physician as well as the radiologist. URADS gives us a hand over others because it uh, enables us for uh, standardized description and um, uh, the risk stratification. Uh, CT, as I said, is uh, the cornerstone, but it is limited because it cannot detect small deposits less than one centimeters, as Dr. Rupa also showed, showed in her uh, presentation, that small 5 mm lesions or 5 mm nodular deposits, especially in the absence of ascites, it is very difficult to pick up on uh, CT, but CT serves as a screening tool uh, and we give CT-PCI. If CT-PCI is less than 20, it means that upfront cytoreductive surgery is possible. If PCI is more than 20, then it is a call as to where all the deposits are. And that is where our role comes in for local extent and distance spread, but CT or PET CT is not for imaging the ovary. So what our role is to tell if there are any unfavorable sites that is which are not surgically explorable or difficult to be explored. So we have to tell those these are peritoneal deposits or mental deposits can be accessible. But if we have deposits along the gallbladder fossa or we have deposits all along the diaphragmatic surface, upfront surgery might not be the choice the gynecologist will go with. And the, for example, this plaque-like deposits in the subdiaphragmatic location deposits all everywhere along the falciform ligament, pericholecystic, periportal. So all these are considered considered as unfavorable sites and that is uh, what CT is able to give us. It is less costly uh, as compared to MRI, less time consuming and it is able to deliver uh, good in, uh, in, uh, substantial, uh, with substantial efficacy and accuracy. So MRI is reserved as a problem solving tool in ovarian malignancies. So whenever we report, we have to first describe the primary lesion whether we are able to ascertain that the mass is arising from the adnexa, that is ovarian or tubal erosion, if it is unilateral or uh, bilateral, if it is cystic solid or solid cystic, solid uh, cystic with solid component, and what kind of enhancement is it showing? How are the margins, whether it is infiltrating the surrounding structures, for example, uterus, whether it is engulfed this uh, relation with the sigmoid colon or the bladder, because up, it looks that it is uh, a patient can have only adnexal masses, but still uh, very difficult for taking up with upfront surgery because it is infiltrating the surrounding structure like sigmoid colon or uh, urinary bladder. In those scenarios, the uh, gynae oncologist might want to tie up with urologist or uh, with the um, gastro uh, GI surgeon. 
sedentary people so that uh, because it is going to be an extensive uh, labor and it is not that the only adnexal masses will be removed because if they remove just to the debulking uh, the patient will just come up with the peritoneal spread and a disease fall over so it becomes very important for us to determine and mention whether there is infiltration of the surrounding structures if there is ascites if there is peritoneal deposits we are supposed to mention about the sites in the omentum whether it is supracolic or infracolic peritoneal deposits in the mesentery root of small bowel mesentery along the sigmoid along the serosa of the bowel loop because these areas are the ones uh, that which are not which make patient are not amenable for upfront crs or hyp the deposits we have uh, as that diagram was shown there are some 12 areas and we have to mark a uh, according to that whether there are any deposits in that particular location the lymph nodes the presence of supraclavicular and paracardiac lymph nodes stay up stages uh, the carcinoma uh, the patient and then it, the patient might just be taken directly for the palliative intake in the patients who have come after uh, say post chemotherapy or uh, just prior to surgery or after surgery for surveillance it is usually managed or observed with uh, the ca125 levels but at times now we have started seeing patients who have huge masses very much peritoneal spread but ca125 still is never more than 300 so in those patients ca125 and follow up following up with hormonal markers is uh, not what is what can be followed and uh, then uh, the imaging uh, comes Uh, is incorporated with the serum markers and in those scenarios we have to be very vigilant for looking for any kind of deposits any kind of soft tissue be it in pelvis pelvis or entire abdomen if there is any peritoneal spread uh, and where exactly is it is it still resectable or is it infiltrating the surrounding structures presence of ascites lymph nodes and comparison becomes very important in such scenarios as dr akshay mentioned so to conclude treatment options in gynecological malignancies are continuously evolving and so is imaging and the every imaging modality has its own role in a particular malignancy and it is all indication dependent in the present state the role of imaging is in the form of ultrasound uh, and mri for uh, ca cervix primarily mri for endometrium and ct for ca ovary pet ct for distant a uh, metastatic workup uh, uh, especially in the patients who uh, the there will be a different specific difference will be made uh, uh, in the surgical protocol all these checklists and not only gynae oncology other oncological forum are also available uh, in the in our website of iri and icri and uh, anyone can just freely download thank you Yes, madam. Uh, is there any question? Question to Doctor uh, Doctor Ekta. Yes, again. So I don't see questions in the chat box. So we could move to the next speaker. Thank you, Doctor Ekta. Thank you. It was a very nice, comprehensive lecture. thank you half of my job was already done by previous speakers <laughs> yes thank you thank you dr ekta for your uh, nice talk uh, now the uh, enjoyable quiz session attractive prizes are awaiting um, uh, may i request professor shana parvin madam to uh, start the quiz session uh, can we have dr nitin shetty session before going on to the quiz he's already logged in i think Okay. 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 He is going to enlighten us on the role of interventional radiology in gynecological malignancies and benign conditions. Yeah, sometimes at the end of the session, the, some participant late, so we try to show the poll question. So, oh, okay. End, okay. Okay. At the end of the session, we will show the quiz. Okay. Yes, so sure. Because you, think... you want to conduct a quiz if the audience oh. are. No, sir. Okay. Okay. Want to leave? Yeah. No. Okay. Okay, madam. Uh, sure. 
Uh, now, our uh, last but not the least speaker uh, for the session, uh, Dr. Nitin Shetty, Interventional Radiologist, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, uh, Officer in Charge of Radio Diagnosis and Interventional Radiology Department at Advanced Research Center for Treatment, Research, and Education in Cancer, the R&D Wing of Tata Memorial Center. Uh, he will speak on diagnostic and therapeutic intervention in gynae oncology. Um, over to you, Dr. Nitin Shetty. Yes. Uh, thank you, Farana, for the kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the Bangladesh Oncology Club for uh, giving me an opportunity to uh, talk on interventions in gynec malignancy. Uh, can I share the screen? Yes. I'll just wait. Okay. Is my slide visible? Yes, it is visible and you're audible. Yeah. So. Okay, all yeah. right, yeah. Fine. Thank you. Uh, it's when I got a request to talk uh, you know, about uh, the role of IR in gynecological oncology, I was pretty surprised because it's not common to get a request from the gynec onco team to talk uh, uh, on intervention radiology. Uh, that is when I realized uh, that uh, Palak had something to do with that. You know, uh, so I'm thankful to Palak also for including IR as one of the topics in this uh, uh, interesting uh, session. And just to go ahead with my talk, uh, I would like to actually thank my uh, fellow, uh, Dr. Anura Gupta, uh, who helped me in preparing this uh, uh, presentation. So mm, this pretty much this slide summarizes what we do in gynec uh, oncology. And we were uh, not sure, you know, we were debating as to what should come first and in the uh, order of importance or in the order of the procedures that we do. And finally, he decided, you know, sir, I'll just put up all the intervention that you do in, uh, in the gynec oncology and you click on any of them as per your convenience and then you talk on that. So this is what he has done. Uh, he's a bit tech savvy, so I'll just start off with the biopsy and uh, drainage. So, I don't have to tell about when a biopsy is done. Basically, any advanced malignancy where you would want to start chemotherapy, uh, you definitely need a tissue sampling. And uh, it can be uh, the, uh, this particular four images shows you a different sites from where we can uh, we expect to see malignancy and from where we can uh, target. So uh, there are a few locations wherein you can very safely do under ultrasound guidance. As you can see here, it is pretty large mass, bilateral leg neck cell mass. Uh, what we need to actually uh, be sure is that we are not going to concentrate, uh, we are not going to target the necrotic area. So here you can see on one side, we have got a, a left head neck cell mass, which you uh, necrotic or non-enhancing area. On the right side, you have got well-enhancing uh, solid areas, which uh, needs to be targeted so that the sampling is adequate and we are able to get a histopathological diagnosis. Similarly here, uh, it's not the primary tumor, but uh, we have got a lot of uh, next, uh, uh, the peritoneal deposits, uh, which again can be very easily targeted under ultrasound guidance and sufficient meta uh, material can be obtained. Uh, in this case, it turned out to be metastatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, here is a situation where uh, the patient has, is a known case of CA cervix, uh, received treatment, recurred subsequently. And now whenever CA cervix, uh, no, most of the time diagnosis is done by a punch biopsy and a direct uh, examination. But once post-treatment, especially post-RT, because of vaginal stenosis, it becomes difficult to obtain uh, the punch biopsy in which situation uh, we need to do it uh, percutaneously. That's one option. And the second option is to do it under uh, the uh, trust of the TVS guidance. So we have, our, our own study done at TMH where we have done uh, patients uh, where the uh, the recurrence was approached by uh, the rectal root, that is trust-guided biopsy was done. Here you can see the close proximity of the uh, recurrent mass uh, in relation to the rectum. And it can, uh, and in our study showed that the uh, accuracy and uh, the yield is more than 95%. And now pretty much it has become the standard of obtaining uh, uh, biopsies in patients who recur in case of CA cervix after treatment. 
Here you can see uh, this is a case where uh, it is a, there's a large ethnic cell lesion, uh, cystic lesion with an enhancing node in the uh, retroperitoneum in the paraepic location. Uh, it is difficult to target under ultrasound, so that is where you target it under uh, CT scan. Again, uh, this turned out to be serious adenocarcinoma. Uh, this is an interesting paper where they had studied the utility of both uh, CT scan and sonography individually and in combination. That is where both, the, both of them were used for the same patient. And they have they, uh, they concluded that the specificity is extremely high. It is 100% whether you use sono or CT scan or whether you use it in combination. So in our practice, by and large, whatever is feasible by ultrasound guidance, we always go by uh, by ultrasound, be it transabdominal or uh, tra or transrectal. And difficult locations, or when we are repeatedly getting uh, negative uh, biopsies because of uh, uh, necrosis, that is when we uh, go by CT scan guidance. Uh, we target the enhancing area, or uh, like the last example that I showed, when it is in the paraiotic retroperitoneal region. Uh, we need to be very specific, precise. Uh, we use the CT guidance. This is the paper that I was mentioning, uh, which was published in BJR way back in 2008, uh, where a study uh, where uh, this uh, we did an audit of all the prescribed biopsies that were done for recurrent CSR with post treatment, and uh, the conclusion was it was safe, feasible, and accurate, and that's why it has become the standard of care at our institute. Now, apart from biopsies, uh, even the some of the collection, especially post-op or post-chemotherapy, uh, uh, if the patient develop any abscess in the pelvis, it can also be drained by imaging guidance. Uh, most of the time, again, uh, if it is quite superficial, it can be drained by ultrasound. But when it is located deep, as in this case, where it is just a pre-sacral in location, uh, we would prefer to do it under, under CT guidance. And uh, here, a transgluteal approach was taken, and a pigtail was put so that the uh, the sepsis is uh, controlled. So this is a case of C. A. Cervix uh, post-op developed a collection and drained by transgluteal approach under CT scan guidance. So apart from uh, the post-op collections, uh, we uh, do uh, also uh, at time to time uh, get to intervene uh, lymphatic collections that is called lymphocytes. Uh, most of the time, uh, by and large, it is managed conservatively and you actually do not require any drainage. But those who get infected or develop a recurrent uh, lymphocyte collection or if it develops, uh, uh, if the patient gets some pain in the abdomen or uh, has developed pressure symptoms, that is when uh, we would drain that. And uh, if it continues to recur even after repeated drainage, uh, then we can also uh, inject sclerosant, that is either sodium tetraidesal sulfate or bleomycin, which would essentially uh, sclerose the uh, margins and then uh, control the lymphocytes. So uh, this is another place where we would put the drainage tube. And uh, the one more situation in gynec malignancy where uh, you put a drainage catheter is when uh, when the patient develops malignant ascites. So uh, this is a situation where uh, it is the uh, patient has not responded to any chemotherapy or completed all the chemotherapy and essentially uh, has been declared as the uh, best supportive care only. Patient uh, is mostly symptomatic because of the large ascites. And uh, to relieve the patient's symptoms, it is uh, common for the patient and the relative to repeatedly visit the hospital and drain the fluid. In such situation, what we put is a special uh, uh, catheter called an indwelling uh, catheter. This is uh, placed subcutaneously, it is tunneled and put into the abdominal cavity. Uh, the specialty of this is the patient can drain uh, the SITs at home at their own convenience. They don't have to come to the hospital to drain. So this has got a special hub, uh, which you can connect to this uh, device, uh, this bottle. Uh, this is a vacuum bottle. So once uh, the tip of this uh, bot uh, catheter is connected to the uh, uh, indwelling catheter, uh, this, uh, this is under the negative pressure. So automatically drains one liter of the uh, aseptic fluid. And after one liter, it's pretty much stopped. So the patient just has to disconnect this and uh, clean that area, keep it sterile and uh, uh, cover it. 
so at the at the patient's own convenience whenever the patient becomes symptomatic it can be drained and the best part is that uh, the patient does not have to visit the hospital so the repeated visit to the hospital the financial burden on the patient and because the relatives also come along uh, is significantly reduced but most important thing is uh, we the the port uh, the patient and the relative need to be counseled well that uh, the hub has to be uh, properly uh, handled with all uh, aseptic precautions and because this uh, is otherwise connected to the bottle only as and when required this is pretty uh, it gets covered under the patient's uh, uh, the dress and it is not visible outside so that's that is much advantage so next uh, moving on from the uh, biopsy drainage uh, to the uh, uh, let's put the venous intervention uh, so there are three things that we do uh, when it comes to the venous route uh, uh, one is central venous access so this is mostly uh, requested by the medical oncologist whenever the uh, iv access is not adequate and uh, uh, the uh, the patient is uh, frail and repeatedly there is uh, going to be extravasation of the uh, uh, injectables then in that case we would either uh, put a central line peripherally uh, inserted central line or called a stick line and uh, in few instances uh, even chemo port if the chemotherapy is expected to go on for a long time so uh, this is where the the request commonly comes from the medical oncologist and um, one of the uh, larger number of intervention that is done on the venous side as far as gynec uh, procedure is con concerned is the ivc filter placement so this is ivc filter uh, you all would be uh, know, knowing that this is done in case uh, the patient uh, develops deep venous thrombosis not all cases of dvt we require to put filter there are specific indications like i mentioned here uh, either the patient has got contraindication for anticoagulation classical setting is in the post op wherein you don't want to give a full dose of anticoagulation uh, the second one is uh, when the patient is non compliant to anticoagulation that is you start the patient on anticoagulation but the patient does not take uh, it uh, regularly and then there is progression of dvt the third one is despite the patient being compliant it is not acting well uh, on the thrombus and there is progression this is where you again uh, put a filter and a uh, few indications uh, in addition to the above is uh, pre operatively that is the patient has dvt uh, and the patient uh, has received treatment still some residual thrombus is present and the surgeons want to go ahead and operate so that's the uh, time when we put dvt because there would be a handling of lot of veins in the pelvis which can uh, result in migration of thrombus for again uh, we put the uh, filter pre operatively but as far as possible all the uh, placement of filter we put a what is called as a retrievable filter so retrievable is once the indication or the purpose of uh, the filter is served then we can retrieve it so if you put it pre operatively then we can remove a couple of weeks after the patient surgery we can uh, remove the uh, filter so these are called retrievable filter which worldwide uh, mostly uh, that uh, this is the one which is put so that it can uh, be removed at a later date now this is an example of ca cervix where you can see the arrow shows that the patient has got bilateral dvt uh, here this is a fluoroscopic image showing the ivc uh, filter uh, which is deployed uh, this is the last step of the deployment where it is already open there is a hydronephrosis again uh, suggesting that there is parametrial involvement and uh, again the route of placement uh, either it can come from top to the jugular uh, via the heart into the uh, ivc and then deployed this is how it is being done and if, however if there is uh, only one particular limb is thrombus for example in this case there is a dvt of the left in which case we can take a femoral axis and uh, do uh, pretty much the same job go from the femoral route and uh, deploy the filter so both jugular and uh, femoral route uh, is Uh, both can be used to deploy the ivc filter and then uh, the next indication is uh, for when the patient develops pulmonary embolism again i would like to say that uh, not all case of pulmonary embolism is an indication for uh, doing some intervention in the pulmonary artery uh, let me give you an example so this is a 50 year old lady who the endometrium who underwent surgery 
and post of day one suddenly developed uh, on uh, breathlessness and hypotension and all the evaluation suggested that the patient is likely to have pulmonary embolism we got a ct scan then here you can see this is contrast filled uh, vein and here non filling area what you are seeing is the uh, thrombus so the patient has got a saddle thrombus saddling both on the right and the left side uh, so that's a massive embolism here you can see uh, the well filled uh, artery on the the main pulmonary artery but on this side it is completely filled with thrombus extending into the peripheral branches too uh, again there were uh, features suggesting that the patient is at high risk for mortality because the right ventricle is enlarged in size the septum is go to the other side and thrombolysis is contraindicated because the patient is post op day 1 and uh, thrombolysis would not be done in situation in this particular uh, situation and the next best treatment option is uh, catheter directed thrombo aspiration so that is what we did uh, we went via the uh, femoral route ivc right atrium right ventricle into the pulmonary artery you can see the filling defect here extending and there is no branch that is opacified at all Oh, in the, of the right lung, we put a large bore uh, aspiration catheter and aspirate uh, the thrombus from as many branches as possible. And this is the final angiogram. Here you can see that the upper lobe and part of lower lobe has opened up. And here we uh, we do not go very aggressively and try to aspirate all the thrombus. That is not required. Uh, we just need to make open the main pulmonary artery. so that uh, subsequently the flow itself will take care of opening the uh, the thrombus so uh, we continuously monitor the contractility of the heart so when the uh, right ventricle starts contracting adequately uh, that's the time for uh, stopping thrombus and aspiration because patient had a significant pulmonary embolism and cannot be started on anticoagulation this is an ideal case where we put a filter we do uh, did put a filter in this patient also and over a period of a couple of days the vasopressor support reduced as the uh, patient was uh, was actually fine and uh, uh, after after a week the patient was started on low molecular weight heparin uh, uh, discussing with the intensivist and the surgeon that it is a good time to start uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin so these are the uh, this is about the venous intervention uh, now moving on to the ureteric intervention so this is uh, again uh, more specific to the gynecology uh, gynec oncology uh, where because of the anatomy the ureteris in close proximity uh, so anything uh, that uh, extends slightly till the pelvic side wall it likely to involve the ureter and develop hydronephrosis or pyonephrosis so uh, whenever the renal parameters get deranged uh, we would like to do the uh, relieve the obstruction the, as a first step we do a pcn so ultrasound guided uh, here you can see that there is a dilated hydroureter nephrosis under ultrasound guidance you puncture the ureter inject contrast confirm that you are in the ureter and then pa- put in a drainage tube so that the urine drains outside so if the patient is infected again it helps in uh, reducing the uh, controlling the infection and if the patient's creatinine is rising uh, this drainage uh, of urine externally uh, helps in uh, improving the rft uh, but if the patient is due for uh, chemotherapy then we would like to internalize that we would not want the catheter to be hanging out from the body uh, if the patient is having an infected system or uh, even if the infection is controlled there is a high chance that the patient might get infected if something is hanging out from the uh, kidney so we would uh, go ahead and do stenting so a ureteral uh, stenting uh, is uh, as a next step uh, it's not always uh, we get an obstructive system only for pcn at times we also uh, get post op uh, uh, urine leak whenever there is drain uh, damage to the ureter or to the bladder so we do a diversion percutaneous nephrostomy in such situation so this is an example uh, where uh, we can, uh, the ct scan shows that there is collection uh, uh, in the retroperitoneum and there is leak of uh, contrast from the kidney into that collection so uh, initially a pig tail was put to drain the collection and subsequently uh, pc1 pcn was done it showed that there is a leak uh, of the contrast outside the ureter 
uh, after which a DJ stent was placed. So this is the DJ stent so that the urine drains directly from the uh, renal pelvis into the bladder and bypassing the, the site of leak. So this is one of the uh, simple non-surgical way and quite effective also uh, in dealing with uh, ureteric leak. This is an example, like I mentioned, once the PCN is done, subsequently we, uh, we, we do the anti-grade stenting. And uh, if a stent gets blocked, then again, uh, very easily percutaneously, uh, we go uh, via the urethra uh, and we can do a retrograde exchange of the ureteric stent as is being shown here. So uh, next, moving on to the arterial interventions. Uh, I think uh, arterial interventions, uh, most common arterial intervention that is done is uh, controlling the bleeding tumor. Uh, so the common malignancy for which the tumor bleeding happens and uh, angioembolization is requested is the gestational trophoblastic tumor. Uh, occasionally, we also get uh, uh, request for endometrial bleeding, endometrial uh, malignancies, uh, cervical malignancies, and uh, very rarely uh, vaginal cancers, especially uh, which we see it in uh, pediatric population uh, in case of vaginal rhabdomyosarcomas. Apart from that, uh, even menorrhagia that is caused by secretory ovarian tumors, uh, even uh, this can be controlled by arterial intervention. And uh, the other indications are iatrogenic AV malformations and fistula. So that is any uh, procedure uh, that has caused uh, uh, arterial uh, communication between the arteries and vein. Again, uh, this would result in a bleeding at uh, some point of time. And uh, the last indication would be uh, post-op bleeding, uh, either bleeding PV or bleeding into the uh, abdominal cavity. So that's another indication. So essentially what is done uh, in arterial intervention uh, it is uh, very similar to what uh, we do it in case of fibro, that is a uterine artery embolization. So this is a case, uh, uh, it's a 38-year-old lady. Uh, she had uh, diagnosed with uh, invasive moon and it was uh, evacuated, still post-evacuation. The patient continued to have uh, bleeding PV and the hemoglobin dropped to uh, 7 grams. So when a, a ultrasound was done, uh, you can see that uterus is bulky and you can see a lot of vessels in the uterine, in the uterus, the uterine wall, a mixture of uh, the arteries and the vein. And CT uh, pretty much confirmed that there are large dilated veins in the wall of the uterus. Uh, what is done here is we take a femoral axis uh, and then we go into the uh, common iliac and uh, uh, specifically into the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. From there, we do an angiogram. So this is an uterine angiogram, which shows an enlarged tortuous uh, uh, uterine artery and large dilated veins. Uh, so this is uh, suggestive of uh, AVM, but this is the similar picture what uh, we uh, see in case of an invasive mole too. Subsequently, we take a very small catheter through that, which is called as the micro catheter. So we have go till the site where there is abnormal communication between the arteries and the vein, and then we inject the embolizing material. So uh, embolizing material, again, uh, it differs. Uh, either it can be simple uh, particles, what we call PVF particles or gel foam, or uh, or surgical glue. So this is N-butyl cyanoacrylate, uh, which we inject. So which the minute it comes in contact with the blood, it solidifies and blocks off all this, uh, the blood vessel, uh, which is uh, wherever you inject it blocks. So when you are injecting in the AVM, it would essentially seal off the AVM. So when there is AVM, we go ahead and inject glue. Whereas when it is a pre-operative embolization of a vascular tumor, we put particles so that the patient, uh, the, the tumor bed gets devascularized and the surgeons can, uh, with minimal blood loss, can operate on the patient. So uh, these are the indications, either preoperative uh, angioembolization or angioembolization in a bleeding patient. So this is a follow-up uh, of the same patient. After three months, she was uh, put on OCT and MRI shows that uh, there are uh, no dilated tortuous vessels. So this is a contrast can again, you can't see any dilated vessels. And the patient is uh, cured of invasive mole because of uh, uh, 
the surgery and the rest of the bleeding that was happening because of the engorged vessel was taken care by a uterine artery embolization. So yeah, this this is done. I had to go back home and come down. Moving on to the ablative therapies. Uh, again, uh, ablation simply means uh, it is a uh, birthing. So uh, there are uh, two types of uh, ablative therapies. Either it is uh, thermal based, that is heat based, or it is non-thermal. So when it comes to uh, heat based uh, uh, technology, here we essentially burn the tumor by uh, increasing the temperature of, of the tumor cell. So whenever the temperature exceeds 60 degrees, it causes instantaneous cell death. So using uh, this uh, hyperthermia, there are four uh, technologies uh, that can uh, uh, burn the tumor. One is the radio frequency ablation. The other one is microwave, so it is laser. And the fourth one is HIFU. I am sure that you would have heard of HIFU, where it is used for uh, ablating the fibroids and also a uh, few cases of, uh, of breast cancers and uh, bone metastasis. Essentially, uh, at our institute, we have got uh, RFA and microwave, which is commonly used for ablating the tumor. And as opposite to the hyperthermia is the cold-based technology uh, that is called as cryoablation. So instead of burning the tumor, we freeze the tumor. Uh, again, the uh, end result is same. You are, uh, we, we get the uh, tumor cell death and uh, thereby uh, cancer control. Um, this is the heat base. Uh, uh, the other end of the spectrum is non-thermal, where it is not using any heat. So two types of non-thermal ablations are present. One is chemical, uh, wherein you put alcohol or acetic acid inside the tumor you put, uh, through a needle uh, so that uh, it, co it causes, uh, it becomes tumoricidal and controls the tumor. And the other example is, which is the latest new in the uh, uh, the latest technology, I would say, is irreversible electroporation, which I will uh, just mention as we go ahead. Now, thermal ablation uh, or non-thermal ablation, it is not essentially used for treatment of primary disease. That is, we don't use it for uh, the cervical cancer or ovarian cancer or endometrial cancer. These are used in gynecological malignancies. Uh, when uh, they developed recurrence that to very in a very uh, small burden of recurrence in at a distant site so the most commonly performed rfa is in the liver or in the lung where they develop uh, recurrence and perhaps that's the only site of uh, recurrence so uh, till prior uh, to uh, the uh, the rfa or microwave uh, technology the patient essentially would have undergone surgical metastatectomy or just have would have received chemotherapy. But because of uh, the RFA and cryo, we are able to now uh, control uh, this tumor which uh, develop at a distant site. Uh, this is our uh, setup. We, uh, this is the RFA machines that we have. This is the microwave. So just uh, in brief, uh, RFA, like uh, the surgeon would understand, it is very similar uh, to a cautery. So just how a cautery burns wherever you place it, uh, the RFA needle also essentially burns uh, when you uh, deposit the heat. Uh, so in an RFA, you put a, introduce a needle into the tumor and, uh, and you uh, pass a very low voltage, high frequency current. So when the current energy is deposited uh, in the tumor, uh, the local temperature rises and when it exceeds 60 degrees, it causes instantaneous cell death. So this is how RFA works. As compared to uh, RFA, in a microwave, what we use is called the uh, microwave antenna. Again, uh, the technology, uh, the principle is same. You put the needle into the tumor, and instead of depositing, uh, depositing electrical energy, in microwave, you deposit uh, electromagnetic or the microwave energy itself. So. Uh, it uh, one place the RFA and microwave essentially the efficacy is pretty much the same. The outcome is uh, very similar. The only place where microwave scores over uh, the RFA is when a, when a uh, tumor is present close to the big blood vessel. So whenever the blood vessel size is more than three millimeter in size, 
a microwave burns the tumor well as compared to the radio frequency ablation so this is an example where is a case of ca ovary post surgery and chemo uh, uh, presented with the solitary subcapsula deposit you can see here this is the deposit uh, which showing fdg avidity which developed after 2 years and pet scan confirm that this is the only site of metastasis uh, for which hello should i continue yes we can hear you yeah so where uh, percutaneously ct guided uh, uh, rf electrode was inserted and ablation was performed and post ablation you can see that uh, there is a good margin again with a minimally invasive treatment without opening up the patient uh, we could uh, achieve the result very similar to metastatectomy uh, as compared to uh, those uh, secondaries or metastatic lesions uh, which we ablate uh, at times we do get few cases uh, wherein uh, it is essentially not malignant but locally aggressive so one classical example is fibromatosis so this is a 13 year old girl you can see that it's a very large tumor which is uh, compressing on the bladder uh, so she had come with acute urinary retention for which police was inserted and again uh, we did uh, an rfa for this uh, patient because uh, this is essentially uh, radiation uh, resistant and surgically also uh, it recur recurs uh, quite aggressively because it is not able uh, the surgeons are not able to completely remove the uh, tumor without any uh, uh, without leaving any residue behind so this patient underwent two sessions of uh, uh, rfa and we can see that that is a zone of necrosis that has come so over a period of time this shrinks and as and when the patient's uh, the tumor shrinks we continue to do ablation so that the patient in uh, so that the patient uh, the quality of life improves and the patient becomes asymptomatic again the goal in fibromatosis is not to uh, go for a complete ablation but to ablate as much enough for the patient to have a good quality of life again similar case uh, of fibromatosis she is a 31 year old uh, uh, dentist who was on chemotherapy of uh, case of fibromatosis on chemotherapy for 7 years it was quite well controlled for 7 years but started progressing in 2019 and in 2020 she also uh, this was all the file was only on the imaging on 2020 she developed uh, pain in the abdomen and when evaluated was found to have hydroerythronephrosis uh, so a uh, salvage uh, pcn and uh, dj was done sorry so you can see that there is a the tumor which is in close proximity uh, not only to the rectum and the uterus but also to the sciatic uh, the nerve on the lateral aspect and in this Uh, case uh, we used a new modality that was uh, that is cryo ablation so the uh, the beauty of cryo ablation is uh, when we are doing ablation we can see the eyes also here what you are seeing the black color uh, the, the hypodermic thing is the eyes wall so because we know exactly where the eyes wall is uh, proceeding uh, we can actually uh, make sure that the adjacent or organs are safe so here the sciatic now is identified by uh, injecting contrast all around that so this is called hydro dissection again the rectum is protected by uh, putting contrast and sub and pushing it away and with the eyes wall very clearly seen we can we are sure that we are safe from the sciatic nerve as well as from the rectum so we did cryo ablation and at the end of cryo ablation uh, we can see that there was a good zone of uh, ablation that was achieved Uh, but however there is still some enhancing soft tissue uh, this is the ureter around the ureter and here you can see pretty well that the there is uh, enhancing soft tissue still present um, so when we did a 3d reconstruction uh, the most of the uh, fibromatosis was cryoablated however that around the ureter uh, was still remaining and uh, this is where uh, the uh, next modality that is the latest Uh, in our armamentarium uh, that is irreversible electroporation or in short called as ire so ire was performed uh, ire essentially uh, gives uh, you insert two electrodes and pass a very high voltage current between the two electrodes 
so anything that comes in between these two electrodes uh, these cells they develop holes and they die except those uh, the vessels which have got elastic cell and those which have got collagenous structure and pericellular matrix protein so these are the structures which remain safe which means the blood vessel the nerves the ureter and higher up it would be the bile duct all these structures would essentially uh, remain safe when we are doing ire so uh, you can see that the electrode was placed and in a triangular fashion and ire was performed at the end of the procedure you can see that uh, there is good uh, that soft enhancing soft tissue or rim which was present is also controlled and after 6 weeks you can see that uh, there is significant uh, control of the fibromatosis like i mentioned essentially the patient had come with hydronephrosis so she was on uh, dj stand and post ire she was on dj stand for almost 6 months uh, sorry for a year uh, just a uh, uh, couple of months back her dj stand has been removed uh, and we are just looking forward to see how uh, she would uh, respond if the stricture has gone then uh, our target has uh, that means that we have achieved our target right so the the last fish, uh, the part of my talk uh, that is uh, uh, coming to few palliative procedures that is done so uh, the palliative essentially does not mean that it is being done as the uh, end of uh, life or the uh, as the last option uh, sometimes uh, palliative treatment is done to improve uh, the quality of life in those patients who have already Uh, uh, completed uh, uh, treatment and are cancer free so one such example is uh, cementoplasty or osteoplasty so depending upon which bone you do uh, it gets that particular name so if the cement is put into the vertebra it's called vertebroplasty so what we do in vertebroplasty is essentially insert a needle into the vertebra and then uh, inject cement through that so that the vertebra is hardened so the classical example uh, when we do vertebroplasty in uh, a gynec oncology case is when there is metastasis to the bone and the patient is in severe pain uh, pain not able to uh, control pain even with the uh, analgesia uh, the quality of life uh, suffers because of the pain so this is when uh, we would intervene and strengthen the vertebra by putting cement Uh, a case of ca cervix here you can see that uh, the l3 vertebra that is collapse of the vertebra there is reduction in the height and this post contrast scan you can see that there is enhancement also of the vertebra suggesting that uh, there is a disease of the vertebra and uh, uh, here you can see that an enhancing soft tissue over here so whenever there is soft tissue component also that is present uh, in the vertebra uh, just prior to vertebroplasty we also do tumor ablation like i mentioned rfa for liver uh, in the previous example so here we do rfa of the uh, the vertebral body of the tumor so that the patient has got better pain control so the patient underwent uh, uh, initially needle placement and you can see the rfa needle over here uh, once the ablation was done Uh, through the same needle uh, we can insert uh, cement so that the patient's uh, pain uh, is under control so uh, even when when there is solitary metastasis uh, we have done vertebroplasty along in uh, uh, planning it along with the rt uh, by the radiation oncologist so where the radiation oncology uh, the radiation pretty much controls the tumor and vertebroplasty would strengthen the vertebra so there is an uh, adjunct uh, benefit by combining the uh, two sorry two modalities so while the previous example uh, the uh, cement was put uh, for a malignant case uh, this is an example where it is uh, done for in a benign setting so the patient essentially is a ca cervix patient has received rt and the patient is completely cancer free but bed ridden because of the uh, insufficiency fracture of the sacrum so uh, you can see that the sacrum is hyper intense and you can see the fracture line over here uh, so the first case actually uh, this was discussed by dr supriya i think she is there uh, she has joined the, uh, here and uh, uh, we thought uh, why not try uh, the same is uh, putting cement into the sacrum and see whether the patient is uh, going to get benefited and 
the technique is again similar and the fluoroscopy guidance you put the needle so you can see the needle is in place and then inject cement uh, where you where the fracture is seen and this patient uh, from the pre procedure pain score of 8 had a significant improvement it came down to 2 she was off analgesic and her quality of life significantly improved also following that uh, we have done uh, three more patients again in whom all uh, all the cases of sacroplasty has immensely helped so moving on uh, to the the last uh, i mean this is the last i think the previous was the last but one this at times we also uh, get request for lymphatic intervention it is not common for a lymphatic intervention in gynecological malignancy uh, but those patients uh, who uh, have lymphatic leak especially after surgery and uh, who are not able to uh, be managed by conservative or fat free diet Uh, that is when we get a call to see if anything can be done for uh, stopping the chylus leak. Uh, so whenever a call comes for uh, post-op chylus leak, the first thing that we do is a lymphangiography. Uh, again, under ultrasound guidance, we identify the node in the groin. Uh, then we put in a needle and then we inject again a drug called lipiodol. So this lipiodol is taken up by the lymph node and it goes all the way. Uh, along the lymphatic, so you can here see here that it is ascending along the lymphatic. Uh, then it comes to sister nacelli and goes all the way into the thoracic duct and joins the subclavian vein higher up. So essentially, wherever the site uh, there is a site of leak, we will be able to identify because it would come out from that place, and uh, subsequently we can treat that leak either by injecting glue by the same way, or we can come. retrogradely from uh, from the thoracic uh, uh, from the subclavian vein we can enter into the thoracic duct come all the way down and then uh, inject glue at the site of leak so this is a case um, of a ca cervix uh, posted by definitive ctrt after 6 months developed ascites and uh, she was evaluated for all the causes of uh, ascites and finally uh, it was uh, uh, um, found to be because of uh, chylus leak so that was there was a leak of uh, the leak of lipiodol into the uh, pelvis uh, now uh, when whenever there is leak is identified after lymphangiogram we wait for 72 hours because uh, this 72 hours the lipiodol itself being very thick it closes off this small leak that is present and uh, only in 25% of the time would we want uh, would a thoracic duct embolization required so in this particular patient a simple lymphangiogram itself sealed off the leak and it did not warrant a thoracic duct embolization so this is just an example not a gynecological case but a pancreatic surgery uh, post people uh, developed leak you can see the chylus ascites uh again uh, because it didn't stop after 72 hours of lymphangiography uh, we went all the way from the uh, thoracic duct down to the site of leak and we injected glue and post uh, thoracic duct embolization uh, the chylus content significantly reduced and the patient was uh, did not require any further intervention so uh, to summarize uh, the role of ir is there in the diagnosis where we can do targeted biopsies uh while it, we can do definitely curative treatment in the form of uh, tumor ablation and lymphatic intervention uh we do assist the surgeons especially when uh, in case of uh, urine leak uh, diversion nephrostomy uh, even in an obstructive uropathy the medical oncologist we can do a, a diversion nephrostomy and a stent placement post op drainage uh, placement of pitial catheters and uh, in the palliative setting or placement of inveling catheters pre operatively again the surgeons uh, we can assist by placing the ivc filter in the suspect in the case of dvt saving life uh, in case of tumor bleed and in case of uh, pulmonary embolism again uh, thrombo aspiration uh, they can it's they are picture the life saving procedure and like i mentioned uh, we can improve the quality of life by procedures like corticoplasty sacroplasty or uh, in uh, best supportive care patient we can place an inveling catheter so that they can drain the aseptic fluid at their own convenience at uh, home so 
Uh, now, this has been about uh, the gynecological malignancies. We just uh, published uh, uh, last year the role of IR in obstetric emergencies. So those who are interested, they can uh, definitely refer to this article uh, about the uh, role of IR in ops. So I'd like to thank the uh, Gynec DMG uh, who have been quite supportive and uh, for uh, doing all the interventions. And uh, I would like to thank RHOD and the rest of my colleagues and fellows for uh, supporting me and also helping me with preparing the PPT. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your elaborate and nice and lecture. Actually, we do not uh, used to with this type of the the pain relief by the radiology and also the, the, in, the lymphedema and also the lymphoria in that cases and all cases, the pain management, everything can be done. We usually, we um, known that the radiology, the role of radiology is only the di disease diagnosis, the also the now it is the time where the, also the role in intensive role in the treatment. Now it is the, before the ending the, of the sessions, I would like to um, show you the quiz questions. I request Mr. Amir Hoshan Shohak to show the quiz and all the participants are requested to show the quiz and the uh, participants are requested to answer the quiz and you have the um, uh, attractive prize at the end of the quiz session. Then every two questions for each questions you will get 30 seconds and all are requested to participate in the quiz. And calculating all the questions, give time for all the questions together. Huh? So, uh, 
nine minutes. Uh, should I stop it within ten minutes? Mm -hmm. It's done, stop. sir. Madam, uh, stop it. Okay. okay. I think before the yeah, have we not ended the session? Yes, I ended the ended the session. Ma'am, should I show the correct answer to all? Yeah, yeah, okay. No correct answer, no need. There is the if is the who are the correct answer is. Okay, I didn't show the correct answer. Now here is the result okay. of the session. Uh, which session? We have calculated the result. Have you completed? And in that time, yeah, count yeah, yeah. yes, ma'am, it's completed, ma'am. Okay, okay. If this should end of the near to the end of the sessions, before I like to show the winners, I would like to thanks the all the uh, participants, the faculties, the. the all the faculties from all area of the india from the east india west india south north middle everywhere and to cover all the topics that is anatomy the role of imaging in the management also in the diagnosis also in the address the staging of the disease and also in case of the recurrent disease and also the treatment the um, the recurrence of the, of the disease and the treatment response and also the all the aspects that is CT scan, MRI and also the ultrasound and at least uh, last but not the least also the therapeutic route of the imaging. And she included, I would like to thanks the Dr. Bhagavadukhi Nayu, Dr. Unuradha and also the Dr. Uh, Umita Moheshwari, all the gynae oncologists, some of the gynae oncologists and maximum the radiation oncologists, the medical oncologists and the radiologists, Dr. Onuradha, Dr. The Supriya, Dr. Onurima, Dr. Sinehamam, and Dr. The Rufa, Dr. Ikta, Dr. Um, Lokpi, Dr. The Okoy, and Dr. Nitin Sheshi, and all these. And I, we are very much grateful to all these. And before um, the ending, I would the, give the all the maximum the credits to Dr. Palok and also the, all the faculties. The last three weeks, they did the tremendous job. And today, the, our chairpersons of the today, our the oncology club, Professor Dr. Amy Heiser, she he is busy in her family program. So I would like to request our scientific secretary, Dr. F. M. Kamaluddin Bhai, to comment on this the three days workshop and the conclude the session. And at last, do we will show you the poll winners. Dr. Kamaluddin Bhai, please. So thank you, Shana. It was a long session. We have finished the third day session and it was, as you mentioned, we must thank our, all the uh, faculties from India, uh, whole of the India radiology and non-radiology colleagues for supporting us and your, it was an excellent session and I personally learned a lot. I'm sure all the participants were uh, uh, enlightened and Palak, uh, I wish uh, once you are here in November in our session, we are going to invite you. We want to thank you personally because that is pending from my side for all the support and what the energy that you have shown by gathering so many faculties from around the India. And we are really impressed. We really appreciate it. And it was a great job done. And I'm sure our colleagues were highly uh, benefited from it. It was a great job. Congratulations to Palak and Shahana and all the team. And Oncology Club would like to continue this type of session in future. And uh, we hope that all our friends from India will be with us in our future uh, endeavor. And hopefully, uh, everybody will now take some rest after such a huge effort, especially Shahana and Palak will take some rest. They deserve some rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. We will not take rest. We will work on something else in the meanwhile. Well, so, so dig, on, dig on something, plan something bigger. 
Yeah, sure. And yeah. Dr. Nitin is still here. So I would really thank him for giving that extensive uh, talk because uh, as Dr. Shana rightly pointed out, you know, like it, many people don't know what happens in interventional radiology. So it's a very niche field and there is so much that can be used as a part of the mainstream treatment from their services. So of course, we have a huge IR department and we are very fortunate for our patients. So they tell Dr. Nitin that very soon I will be contacting him and I will be sending one or two fellows there for the training on intervention radiology. This is a totally bare area in your country. I mean, More we are struggling like anything. Them. So very soon you are going to get some friends from Bangladesh in your department. Sure. Definitely. Thank, that would be our privilege. Thank you so much. And yes, it was very nice. And the, the one thing that I would say is all of you all have been very kind and respectful to all of us. Uh, it is a very nice and sweet gesture beyond academics. So I deeply thank for that. And it was great to have this international collaboration. Uh, it's time ties and let's try to make more of these. Right. Thank of you course. so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Another analogy workshop, it is the histopathology workshop. The, we have contacted your pathology colleagues, and I think this, um, and uh, we shall st we can start it after the end of our the BICC. So uh, that may be at the end of the November or in December, we would like to arrange the pathology workshop. And the, all the participants and all they are requested to attend that workshop. And so now mm. answers the results i would just like to yeah. uh, thank you and the entire organizing team and your audience who've been so great and uh, so good with all of us uh, and for letting this uh, opportunity come in and i think most of my colleagues and uh, you know friends have probably not had other commitments and are not here i will personally thank them but yes without them this platform would have been incomplete so the exhaustive uh, uh, schedules have come up because of each one's contributions so thank you for the for everything thank you yeah another message is that the all the recording of all three days three sessions workshop the, it will be available in our oncology club website it is www.oncologyclub.org and it is the gynae oncology imaging series in that name it is available in all three the sessions Sure. Dr. Shana, on that note, I think we, uh, it would be nice. We will just send, uh, you know, one uh, information to all the speakers if they are okay with their talks being displayed on the website. Okay, okay. So I think we just take one, uh, you know, like a little consent, at least, at least verbally, if nothing. If they are okay, then definitely we can display it. Okay. okay. Sure. So I, I will I will check with them. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Palak, normally yeah. we always put in our website all the videos and the presentation. Yeah. Sure, now sir. we have shared it with the participants only, but okay. we want to keep it in our archive library so sure. that uh, we want to uh, allow the participants, uh, I mean, other colleagues to also right. go through it. No, it would be wonderful. It's just that uh, I would you just... You just take permission. It will yeah, be mine is there for my talk uh, already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, you, just from your end, send a common yes. mail to everybody just to get I will everything. do that. Yes, okay. yes, I will do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, is it visible? Hello? Yes, it is visible. So, so here lies the uh, correct answer. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you. Inshallah. The our scientific secretary has committed that we will invite you in our the BICC session in November 17, 18. So see okay. you in November. Thank you. Agreed. That will be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.